What's the biggest scam in the fitness industry? A people that position the method between the consumer and the principal. To me, they're the scam artists. I know what they're doing, they know what they're doing. I still feel fraudulent to this day. A lot of people that are obese and overweight will look into the fitness industry, see that and go, fuck that, I'd rather have type two diabetes. Is it easy for a privileged white male to talk about confidence? Where are we going with this? Maybe I outworked you for a decade. Tyrannic ideology that you can never be woken up. Have you ever taken steroids? Yeah, steroids are terrible because they're not. You feel fucking amazing. You're like a dog with two dicks who gets more muscular by the week. But the negatives of that are, once you do something with that, it's very difficult to move away. What do you think of the liver king? Dishonest about steroid use? 100%. Do we have true freedom of speech? No. Welcome to Disruptors and I'm Rob Moore. Now on the show, we have the controversial personal trainer turned social media influencer, James Smith. This was a deep, surprising and fascinating conversation. We covered many areas, DMT and psychedelics, social media, he did his usual calling out a few other personal trainers. Before we get into this, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. James, what's the biggest scam in the fitness industry? Well, here we go. Do you know what? There, there are multiple bunched together and grouped, and I've said this a million times, where like, we have consumers on the left, we have uh, you know, the principle of how, say, fat loss. And I always talk about fat loss because it's the biggest market with the most pain points. Fair enough, if you're a dude that wants to be more muscular, that is a pain point and there are semi-severe repercussions of it where you know, have body image issues or whatever, but obesity is something that objectively is harming lives and causing issues. So I say, okay, the principle here, creating a calorie deficit, reducing the amount of food you take in versus the amount of exercise. The biggest scam are people that position the method between the consumer and the principle. So the people that host this middle ground and actually keep the principal at bay and unknown because to me they're the scam artists because they're dressing up the solution in a way that gets people to buy into their methodologies and their methodologies only. So anyone that sells the method without the principal to me is a semi-scam artist. I know what they're doing, they know what they're doing and I've spent time as a consumer that's bought into these things. There was one called the Insanity Workout and I watched the YouTube video people jumping around burpees on the floor and I was like this is what I need people shredded losing weight I did the insanity workout for a month trained every day and didn't lose any weight no one told me that I needed to restrict the amount of calories coming in so I was thinking that my hit workout was going to burn calories enough for me to have pizza for dinner from Domino's so that's where I got the chip on my shoulder is that their job though the people who design the insanity workout is that their job to talk to you about calorie deficit and all of that considering that I bought into the transformations that had occurred on it and they were very savvy. They were probably one of the best digital marketing uh, salespeople at that time. I read somewhere they made 10 adverts using different demographics of different people, whether Hispanic, black, white, fat loss, training, muscle growth. Then over 52 states, they played all 10 adverts and then looked at which one in each state performed the best and put their marketing behind that. And then they had such a diverse difference in adverts going out to demographics. And I was like, wow. This was about selling programs. It wasn't so much about the end results. So yes, it was this because they put a little pamphlet in that said, oh, these are some meal ideas for you. But I was like, no, nah, this is a workout based solution. So I did the workouts, put the DVDs in, jumped around my front room, left sweat patches on the floor. This little pamphlet with Greek yogurt and plain chicken breasts in it. It, didn't, it wasn't sold to me as an important thing because yeah, I suppose the product was the exercise. I saw you do a video with the, was it called the Swimmer's Dilemma? Is that what swimmer's Body Illusion. That's it, the Swimmer's Body Illusion. And you know, you pretty much called the guy out by saying um, what he looks like isn't what he's telling you or what he does. So in the sort of fitness influencer space, what do people peddle that's not really good for people? So with that example, the guy, <laughs> The guy's first five seconds to a video, I was like, oh, this guy's a bit annoying. Like, <laughs> what up, Kings? And like, I, I tried to make it, maybe I didn't get it across well. There could be a chance this guy is genetically gifted. He had just gone through a weight loss transformation himself. But the point was that there are a lot of people that don't have to work very hard to look a certain way. We all know someone, and this isn't me shitting on everyone, it's me shitting on a small percentage of people. There's, we've all <laughs> Which got, makes uh, it better. Yeah, I feel better. <laughs> there are some people out there that, you know, 
don't put any effort into the way they look and they look great. And we're like, are you kidding me? This guy, he eats all day, he eats rubbish, he has takeaway for every meal and he's shredded. Yeah. Those people very quickly, their friends, oh, you should become a personal trainer. You should work in the fitness industry. And those people, the idea of that was to say, not everyone looks the way they do because of what they preach. They preach what they're preaching because of the way they look. So, you know, over time, sifting people through these kind of like funnels, the people that put on muscle easy are probably going to sell bodybuilding programs. People that respond to steroids very well are going to do that. Alternatively, those that can remain very lean are probably going to sell fat loss plans. Whereas that in some respects, people need to look at that at face value because if someone doesn't have to work very hard to achieve their goals, they might not be giving you the best advice that's right for you. And that was what I've seen in the in the kind of fitness industry. You can tell very quickly who's coached people and who hasn't. I do- um, How? Because the information they give, the way they're constructing sentences and also their understanding of people's pain points. They're pretty shit at selling things because they've never experienced the pain point themselves. So, you know, when you say to people about, you know, the amount of times that they've said they'd do it on Monday, the amount of times they've given up, the amount of times they felt like they're inferior to everyone else because of their relationship with food, the people that, you know, are always hungry. There are a lot of people in the fitness industry that have never had this. They've never pulled their top down at a meeting when they stand up. They've never got self-conscious with the lights being on when they fuck. So for those people, you can sometimes tell there's a bit of a, a gap between what they're saying and what they're selling. Similarly to, uh, I do the audiobook recordings for my books and the people that I work with in the studio go, we can tell you've written this book. And they go for a lot of authors that come in. Well, that's bad, isn't it? If they're saying we can tell you've written this book, that must mean a lot of people haven't written their own book. Exactly. Just that context is like, oh, yeah. they're surprised. They're, yeah, because I'm, uh, a lot of fitness influencers don't write their own books. They're ghostwritten. Even some books that authors get a huge amount of money for, they'll spend 20 hours with a ghostwriter, which is, is a lot of time, but it's also not. And, you know, that annoys me as well that some people, especially in the fitness industry, let's say you've got an upward trajectory of followers and you've got a very, uh, you know, good features, great physique, not too athletic, so that'll put off housewives, you know, all oh, great face symmetry, oh, great teeth, this person's on the up. A business will then come along and pretty much customize all of their business and they just become the face of it. And could you argue that's good branding and good business? Oh yeah, it is. Absolutely. I mean, if you're shit at writing, it is, but then a lot of the process has become business orientated, not customer centric. So yeah. uh, for instance, HIT training, if we remove all of our previous experiences with HIT and high intensity, it is a modality of training that everyone is accessible to. It is a lot of impact. It's done in a short period of time. It requires no equipment. Anyone with a front room can do it. Is it congruent with a long-term habitual change, lifestyle change? Not really, because for many people, that amount of impact is only going to cause them issues later on in life. It's very difficult for people to sustain that. And then again, we have uh, the survivorship bias. The people that do HIT for 10 years, they turn around and they go, you're crazy. You know, this has been great. It's changed my life over 10 years. All of the people that did it, hated it and fell off with it and got into resistance training aren't there at the end to say how amazing it is. When we look at, you know, uh, long-term training for people, especially in their 30s, 40s, 50s, we want to limit the amount of impact we give people, even professional athletes from sports teams. The reason the box jump exists was to stop the impact of the athlete hitting the ground after doing a plyometric jump. It was to mitigate the amount of impact you give to a professional athlete. So when you've got people jumping around their front rooms, doing high knees, some people will love it, but it's very easy from the outset. Someone sat in a room and gone, you know, what, what kind of training do you think is best for this person? Three weight sessions a week, moderate intensity, no, 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 no. You know, people don't like squat racks. People don't like, now nah, give us something else. Um, you know, do, no. What could they do every day that we could sell them? Oh, hit training, perfect. How are we gonna market this? Fat loss, yeah, it's a fat loss hit workout. What are we gonna talk about? Heart rates, intensity, fat, sweat, crying. Suddenly, the, it, I'm pretty sure I could be wrong. With aftershave and perfume, they pick the smell last. Have you ever heard that? No, I definitely heard that Red Bull, they intentionally went with the bad flavour because people didn't like it. Oh, really? So they doubled down on it to have a, um, I guess, I guess a contrarian and standout 
yeah, I, I'm, that might be something different. So, so yeah, but this, if they pick the smell last, a lot of the time they probably sat around the table with some fitness influencers and said, what's going to sell the most? And then they get to this point where it's going to have to be at home, it's going to be non-invasive for people, it's going to have to be short on time, and they created this half an hour hit workout. Then they had to backtrack and market it to be the best thing ever. So that's what I see a lot in the is fitness industry. Is that scam or is that smart marketing? Well, can it be both? Yeah, because if you write a fucking great book that the market isn't interested in, is that a great book? I, I was interviewing my favourite rock star ever. He's not mega famous, but to me, it was basically like I was interviewing God. And he said, music should be selfish. You should write for yourself. You should not write for anyone else. Music should be selfish. And I thought, well, wait a minute, though. It's your people who buy your albums and go to your gigs that like your music, should you not listen to what your fans want and should you not be relevant to the moment? And where, where is that line between I'm doing art because it's right, i.e. you want to write whatever fucking book you want? Would, all right, let me, would you rather write a fucking great book that you're proud of and you sold one copy or a very average book you're not that proud of and you sold 10 million copies? Well, it would probably, I'd like to have a middle ground between no, the but two. That's, <laughs> it, which one? It would haunt me if I wrote the one just for mass sales, because if it was just about money, sales, uh, you know, notoriety, then I would have made many decisions differently throughout my career. Now, not doing, you'd probably think I'm crazy, never done a paid post, never done a brand collaboration, never done any of that, because it doesn't sit well with me. I got offered uh, 50,000 Australian dollars, so call it 25,000 pounds, to do an advert with a company whose product I use, and I didn't have to post it on any of my socials but they said I couldn't use certain swear words <laughs> for the two, <laughs> for two Your weeks. Your favorite C word. Yeah. yeah, so I was like, oh, no, we're not gonna do it. And if I ever feel like I need to suppress myself or, you know, it would be very easy for me to accept these kind of brown posts or collabs, but integrity is a big thing. So I think it probably would be the, the one copy Yeah. because then at least I could sit back and go, fuck you. Like, you know, the sellout thing, it would fuck haunt me. Fuck you, I'm broke. <laughs> and it, I'd rather have less money over a longer period, but maintain integrity. Now myself at 43 might massively regret that, but in the moment it feels right. Mm. And I see quite a lot of people, they kind of almost like lose their soul a bit. Because once you start down that track of just doing things for money, it can... Well, marketing isn't necessarily just doing things for money, is it? If you've got a good product and service and you've tested the market, finding the way to get that to as many people as possible, so mine's only based off my own uh, experiences and my own life experiences. So for instance, we spoke about starting off doing HIT and thinking HIT was everything. Then slowly I kind of tripped over through finding my way to resistance training. And it took me a good few years, but when I finally understood what I was doing, which was another pain point, I didn't know how to squat, how to deadlift, what tempo I should be lifting at, any of these things. Then when I was at 24, I was like, wow, I felt like my life had been a bit fraudulent with everything that had happened beforehand. And I finally at 24 was like, I could do this every week for the rest of my life. And then that was the voila moment. And I was like, right, let's now start the tedious process of converting people to my ideology, which happens to be what I would think. Which rather, is marketing. Yes, which is marketing. But it was more so getting people on board with that. And I joke around and I say, I really regret doing resistance training and eating a high protein diet, said no one ever. And there are a lot of pain points because I'm, I'm now taking people from potentially the comfort of their own homes to a very uncomfortable area in the gym. I, make, I banter about it. I go, this building has been created to make your life easier. Everything in here ergonomically is designed to make your life comfortable. The temperature of the room, the knurling on the bar, the staff at the front desk, the showers in the change room. I was like, everything here is to help you, but yet it's still a very intimidating area for people to go into. So. Um, Part of me, I do wake up some days and go, I should have sold a fucking hit plan. But <laughs> I like the fact that although having, you know, probably fewer clients and fewer people through a marketing funnel, I have the integrity to say that I've aligned people with more long-term sustainable habits. Yeah. And another thing that can be lacking is education. And that is a tough one because some people don't want to be educated, but, um, you know, just teaching people, as I spoke before, we got the consumer, the method, the principle. I very much just teach people the principles so they can do whatever they want. Someone might listen to what I've said and gone, I'm not eating breakfast and so I'm at this weight. They've now utilized the method of intermittent fasting, but I didn't tell them they had to. Someone else might reduce carbohydrates or go low calories during the week. People talk about the 5-2 diet, where they go two days a week, very low calorie. I prefer the 2-5 diet. I have five days of you know eating semi like a pauper and then being a 
you know, binging at weekends. Like, it's the weekend, I'll have anything. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's the best way, in my opinion, to do things. But again, like I say, I am littered with my own biases, but it seems to work for people. And I try and, in some respects, repel my prospects to the point that any people that I don't think would be served by my style are out funneled very early. So I'm left with a very strong base of people that are interested in doing business and they understand my values very openly. I had clients that sat with me. I'd have a consult in a gym. I used to work in a budget gym in Bracknell. They'd sit down, I go, James, you swear a lot. You get to the point, I think we're gonna get on. I'm fucking fat, I don't exercise, I'm lazy as fuck, help. And I, I was like, wow. The first interaction I've had with someone was actually perfect mm. for the first time because I wasn't trying to be, you know, someone that appeases to everyone. Because mm. then I feel like you can get some poor quality leads through your funnel, which are only going to cause you more pain running a business. What do you think of the liver king? Dishonest about steroid use, 100%. Where he had like needles pointing into cakes. He was like, oh, I'm not on, like, or whatever. The actual needles were the exact ones you would use to inject steroids. So I'm like, funny that you sent your PA out to get needles, you got the exact ones you would use for intramuscular injections. What's interesting is you said up until, I think you said age 24 or, or early 20s, you finally sort of found your flow and you felt like a fraud with the things that you were trying to figure out before. But aren't we all just trying to figure out our life? It doesn't make you a fraud because you didn't have it perfect when you started. Yeah, I mean, um, I still feel fraudulent to this day with some, some things. You know, like the book stuff still is weird. When someone goes, oh, I read your book, I really liked it. Uh, to me, it was like writing a well-paid blog <laughs> at the end of it. When I finished it, I was like, oh, I can relax. Uh, that's why, again, even probably, I felt very fraudulent when I did like corporate jobs. I'd sit in a suit and I'd be like, yeah, you know, I pretend I cared about the, the job. I did our recruitment sales. I was like, yeah, I'm a passionate individual. I wasn't, I just wanted to earn money so I could afford things in life. Then when I became self-employed and started running my own business, then the fraudulency just changed into getting paid. Every time I got paid, I was like, wow, a hypocritical sometimes. I struggled with the idea of, I wouldn't pay myself for that same amount of money. So let's say I charge 40 pounds for an hour. Every time I got paid, I was like, I wouldn't pay me 40 pounds. When I have people come to my events, again, I had the same thing then. I go, would I pay 35 pounds to come see myself at the events in Apollo? So that's just changed. And it's kind of spurred me on to approach a more affordable, Part of the market where I now charge less for a month for online PT than I used to for an hour. But yeah, to your point, I think that that maybe will never go away. And you're, you're completely right. We're all kind of just trying to figure it out as we go along. Is that what people call imposter syndrome? Yeah, and some people refute this quite heavily. Uh, Paul Moore uh, from South Shields, he says, oh, you know, it doesn't exist. But I think we all do feel like imposters and I think we all should at some point, you know whether it's your first day as a CEO, first day as a father or a mother, first day mentoring someone at work. Yeah. You need to pretend you, you know what you're doing. For that, that day I said to Stephen Bartlett, I go, the first day you did your podcast, and even yourself, you need to turn up, you know, as an imposter to being a podcaster. You look at the camera, you go, hey guys, welcome today. I'm joined by this guy. You've never done that before. That is you being an imposter, but you're, you're portraying the person you need to be for that moment in time. And, uh, I think that's, that's genuine. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to talk about imposter syndrome for a bit if you're all right with that, because in a way, I agree that it's not a thing. I think it's a label that we've attached to a natural human feeling. Like a lot of people think, like you as an author, you know, if I said, I've got James Smith on the show, credible, double Sunday Times best-selling author, you might think, oh, fuck, am I? You, you know, you may not fully fit into that. You might feel like the, the fraud that you said. But to me, that's just a feeling of protection to make sure your ego doesn't go wild so you keep yourself safe. So not feeling yet like you're perfect or you're ready or you're sort of making this up is a good feeling so you don't fucking ruin your whole life. I think, I think, John, we could, we could both be correct with that standpoint. They're not like, it's not like a dichotomy with our understanding of this principle. I felt it again, uh, first time I ever flew a business, or actually the first time I ever didn't fly economy, I flew first. And again, I, I partied a bit too hard in Croatia. I did sail week. 
I'm sat at home and my mum and dad's looking through the videos of the week, shedding a tear. I was like, this is a big come down. <laughs> I had the idea of facing an economy flight. I was like, I can't do it. So I, d I didn't have the money and I don't, when people, some people get annoyed when you post a picture in business or first and they go, when can you afford it? I'm like, you can never afford it. I've never looked at a price on a business class flight and gone, oh, that's good, you know? Yeah. But you're just in a position where the pain of going the economy feels worse <laughs> yeah. than the loss of the money. And um, I sat in first class and I genuinely felt like I was, I was lost. I sat there and I was like, cool. Everyone's being really nice to me. And I was like, this feels weird. And I genuinely felt like an imposter then. And they came yeah. over and I was like, excuse me, when do you eat on this flight? And they were like, we'll get the chef. I'm like, the chef? I didn't do any research before. And the whole time I sat there, I was having a glass of wine and watching a film. I was like, I don't belong here. I was like, I was looking around. I was like, everyone else here has got a legitimate business. Everyone else here is entrepreneurial, business minded. I, I felt like a PT that just got a bit lucky with, you know, social media, marketing, whatever. And every time I got paid, you know, like a, a good dividend, I was like, no. I was like, I felt like someone had put money into the wrong account. So for me, I think, as we spoke offline a little bit, I'm very fortunate to have an incredibly smart business partner who manages those things. And I kind of live in a, a vacuum, an echo chamber, even with large social media followings as well. Uh, I always loved playing video games when I was younger, Call of Duty, loved it. Whatever can be competitive, I love being competitive. And I would look to the numbers, like kill death ratios or whatever it was, and I always wanted to be better. And with social media, I admit that I treat these numbers as arbitrary, but I use them as ways of deeming whether or not I'm achieving a high score. One of the reasons I love YouTube at the moment is the analytics of saying, more people watch this, more people engage. And I'm like, yes, I'm never connected to the fact these are real people. I am in the sense that I want to serve them helpful, good content and run a, an online platform that serves them. But at the same time, I don't sit there going, yeah, millions of people follow me, which again could be the point you say about ego. But at the same time, I feel like I'm completely oblivious to the fact that that's an amount of people. I go to a stadium, like say you go to Twickenham and you're like, wow, this many people watched my story within three hours of me posting it. And I can't compute that. So I think they're using the emotion of feeling like an imposter makes it easier for me to process. Mm. So, that. Great. I could talk about this part all day, but we've got 932 questions left. I would like to talk about body image for a bit, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, being selfish, I have major body image issues. I was the fattest kid in my school age, sort of 11 to 14. Pretty brutal fucking time to be the fattest kid in your year. And I lost the weight at 14 and started to get girls and started to not have people take the piss out of me and started to get in the good teams at school and started to get the good grades. But I still felt like the fat kid inside that everyone was talking about me, hated the way I looked. I still don't like, this parts of my body I like, but not this part. Um, and I, I cannot get, I cannot ever look at myself, no matter how good in shape I've ever got and been happy with the way my torso looks, yet I'm not fat anymore. It's a tough one where... By the way, I'll pay you going rate for the therapy, so just whatever it is, lay it down. I'm a, I was the same where at school, fat tub of lard. I remember that. I can name, I don't remember anyone's names at primary school apart from the kids that called yes, me Yes, me too. Yeah. And I, I remember them. And sometimes I like the idea of like knowing jujitsu, I hope to get my brown belt next year. And I like the fact that I would love to confront them one day and just be like, you, you were a fucking dickhead for what you said. Like, I don't, I think they're very much different people today. And they were, prob they were also probably hurt at the time. Exactly. Yeah. But I think it would be quite nice to maybe just choke them out and leave them somewhere and at the train. A, and do a TikTok live yeah, on it at the same time. Just leave them unconscious at the train station <laughs> yeah. and be like, one all. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, yeah, very much the same. And the thing was, I wasn't actually that fat. It wasn't like the doctors or nurses would be like, oh, this guy's going to have type two diabetes. Mm -hmm. But I shouldn't be a 10 year old kid asking dinner ladies what's fattening. You know, that should never have come into the equation. And like, I'm very close to my mum and dad, but they didn't know what the problem was, you know. And again, I said video games, being inside sedentary, all these things played into it, but no one ever put the bits together for me. But one thing, even three, four years into being a PT, I was like, why don't I have abs? And as far as fat distribution, I only store fat on my stomach. My legs and my arms are really lean all the time. My rugby teammates used to joke and go, you've got the best vest rig ever. When you wear a vest, you've got the best body, like body in the team. When you take that off, you don't. But, and then I was like, instead of my fitness friends that have got six packs, were like, how are your legs so lean? 
But I was looking at them going, how's your stomach so yeah. And even between men and women, sometimes women that tend to store more fat on their thighs have flatter stomachs. The guys look at their partner and go, how's your stomach so flat? And they look at their partner and go, how are your legs so lean? So it's one of those things where I never looked at my strength. And even fitness was so much about how your stomach looks when really I found that the majority of my compliments that I get from women was about my shoulders being broad, my shoulder to waist ratio, or having well-developed legs. I was completely off. My insecurities didn't match up with the reality of the outside world. But I think in some respects, I like insecurities. And I speak about this in the, the new book because they show us the path to getting better. And what you and I both probably both suffered from was looking at the reality of our, our current existence and losing sight of the trajectory of our path that we were on. So both of us would have worked and accomplished tremendous feats in battling our insecurities, but we were too focused on you know, an alternate reality of what we thought we should look like that we lost track of what we'd done. And that to me, it, it is something that everyone struggles with. I think now, although we communicate more than ever, we don't talk about insecurities and the way we feel. I feel like emotions um, get parked a lot. This is why I love podcasts because you can really unwrap a conversation because it's one of the only times you talk to someone they don't have a phone in their hands. So uh, yeah, I think that every man that listens to this and every woman would agree that they're still not happy. You look at the extreme lengths bodybuilders go to, even Arnold Schwarzenegger doing Mr. Olympia. When he won the title, he still wouldn't have been happy. And that was a real awakening for me where I saw so many people in the fitness industry get such, in such good shape. I was like, wow, these, these people are no happier than me. They've actually just further down the spectrum of eating disorders and irregular eating and unhappy lives and restrict and binge. And that allowed me to kind of take my foot off the accelerator a bit. And one of the best things for me was martial arts where, and you say you did striking, kickboxing, right? I hate being punched or kicked. Like, if I got given a granddad at school, that's what we called it, when someone give you a dead leg. What do they call it from where you're from? I had never heard that, but when you, yeah. Do you call it a dead leg? Yeah, or? just dead leg, yeah. We called it a granddad, because you, you crack someone in the leg, and then they'd be limping, you'd be like, ah, granddad. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but then there'd be parts where I'd get a granddad, and I'd be like, I want to kill this person. I like, it wasn't a nice emotion to have it, so I was yeah. like, I need to learn a martial art where I'll never hit someone. If anything, I'd just like to manhandle someone a bit and control them. That's my style. Don't like to hit them, but you're quite happy to strangle them. Yeah, or just hold them. There's some, I remember there's a few times that I had like play fights with jiu-jitsu experts. I've never felt so powerless. Yeah. And being stripped of your ability to feel powerful was much worse than being str struck or, or hit. But now, having martial arts in my year, in like the last five years training, I love the fact that I've weaponized myself while my physique stayed relatively similar. So although my insecurities about my body fat percentage or whatever it is, they're still there, I know that I could spar for an hour tonight with a bunch of complete strangers that wanna you know, put me in an arm bar or trip me out. That to me helps me with everything else. Because when I look in the mirror, there are times that I cyclically go through lean and a bit chubbier, lean, bit chubbier, then I'll, I'll look in the mirror and I'll go, James, you better enter a comp at under 91 kilograms just so you've got something yeah. to move forward to. But then I can lean back and know that I'm still a bit of a weapon, if that makes sense. So I changed the, I picked up the jumpers that were goalposts and in my later 20s moved that to something else. And that was one of the best things for me. But someone that's openly used anabolic steroids and um, in my younger years, you know, it was, everything was about how I look, not how I perform. And I managed to escape that matrix and get into a little bit of CrossFit, which I never talk shit about CrossFit because I actually love it. Getting a bunch of people in a room. Can James Smith say, I'll never talk shit about <laughs> yeah, just that, there'd probably be a few of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> CrossFit would be one of them because it, it genuinely saved me a bit where no. uh, every time you come off steroids, you get weaker and you get smaller. That's hard. But when I did CrossFit, even though I wasn't getting bigger as far as muscles, I was getting fitter, I felt better, my endurance was better. Yeah. And like, I could go head to head with someone on a rowing machine that was about effort. It wasn't about aesthetics. And that to me was a currency that I'd massively unappreciated right and then in jiu-jitsu it's very much the same effort and skill yeah and to be able to have my values taken away from how i look was one of the best things that ever happened someone who's a men mentor of mine he believes that every upside has a downside every downside has an upside and everything has equal upside and downside so he says everybody who has a body there's parts of their body that they love and parts of their body that they loathe no matter who they are what do you think about that yeah, I would completely agree. And I'd say we'd get fixated about, we get so worried about what we don't have, we lose sight of what we do have. Yeah. 
similar to that kind of trajectory kind of thing where it will always plague us what we don't have and you know uh, there's but is that a bad thing because it keeps us driving forward in some respects and as uh, saying that I, one of my friends said lucy lord she goes if we could all put our problems in a pile we take our own back every single time and that i think is quite powerful as well where you know we're all going to have these things and if you think that you don't have if, if you had someone sit here that goes on oh, insecure about nothing you guys are fucking sociopath that's yeah. a narcissist <laughs> that's like, you know, you're more concerned about the state of their mind than anything else is it easy for a privileged white male to talk about confidence where are we going with this tyrannic ideology that you can never be woken up with the political landscape splitting you do see you know even people down that are in the center they're like oh extreme far right sometimes it just makes me not want to engage in it at all You've maybe re-inspired me to restart my martial arts because what I'm hearing here is I don't really like to explain, I just like to have the discussion and let people get their own. I remember reading a brilliant post from Paolo Coelho about writing. That guy sold a lot of fucking books. Um, and he said, don't explain things to the audience, just talk about it. They can pick it up themselves. But I'm going to break that rule. I think what you said is take your insecurities about your body and get good at something, put it into um, a skill or a vocation so you can focus on the functionality and the use of this body you have rather than the look. Yeah, the, the weaponization. So I hate the term self-defense. I hate it because when we look at things, uh, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, we're either doing something to avoid something bad happening so if I say to someone obese, mate, you need to fucking get in a calorie deficit or you're going to have a heart attack, that's not going to motivate them because they're now doing something to avoid a bad thing happening. Whereas intrinsically, I say to that person, look, here's 10 modalities of training. Let's find the one you love the most and let's make you fall in love with it. Suddenly they, they have a reason to get out of bed. So with self-defense, I'm saying, hey, let's get you better at martial arts so that if someone tries to rape you or beat you up, you can fight them. They're then looking to improve a skill to avoid something bad happening, which I don't think from a mindset perspective is what it should be. So is that not how we're wired as human beings to be motivated away from pain? In some respects, but I'd rather say to anyone listening, male or female, big, small, whatever, there's a certain amount of, you know, combative competency you have. Like I pray you never have to use it. I pray I never have to use it. Where is that level of combative competency right now? And why don't we just try and make that the best possible? Then if something bad does happen, you're a certain level of readied for it. Yeah. Rather than me saying, oh, let me, let me teach you some ways out of a headlock in case someone tries to drag you into a bush. No, I think that we all have a certain level of fitness, we'll have a certain acumen, we all have a certain level of combative competency. And I think that's a brilliant pathway to go down with people. And we, I believe we get very much distracted from the fact that we are you know, very primal and primitive in our, the way we think and deal with problems and everything. And some Welsh guy kind of went in on me in the comments the other day. Some Welsh guy. Because he kept calling me Boyle. <laughs> Boyle. And he was like, he was like, you're a fucking embarrassment, blah, blah, blah. I was very constructive. I turned it into a brilliant YouTube video, if I say so myself. But at the end, I was like, he was saying he was bigger than me, therefore he's better than me, he trained more weights. And I was like, you know where I train? Come, we'll do some jiu-jitsu. Because the beautiful thing about jiu-jitsu is that you never want someone to get hurt. I would never, even if I was to get those, my worst enemy in any place and get them, the idea is that I make you powerless to the point you give up. And making someone give up to me is much, much better and more satisfying than hurting someone. I actually don't think I'd ever really genuinely want to hurt someone, especially not injuring someone or anything like that. And at high level jujitsu, people will break legs or whatever. I don't think I'd ever do that. I'd rather lose the match than put someone out on crutches or whatever for a few weeks. And. But the, the beautiful thing is that is people can go, oh, it's really bad you wanted to fight someone from your comments. I go, it's not because I don't want to hurt them. I just want to make it feel powerless. But the beautiful thing is that I'm okay with losing that exchange. So let's say Boyle from the comments comes out and he explicitly comes to fight me and he beats me. I would then stand up and go, do you know what? I called this guy out and he, he fucking beat me. And the best thing is then I would use that to motivate myself to if it ever happened again, that I would try my hardest so that it wouldn't happen. And... That kind of drive that I have in my mind for that, it probably comes, it was best articulated by Hicks and Gracie, one of the all-time goats in martial arts, and he says, losing is not the same as being defeated. So losing, I could lose to that guy. I'm only defeated if I never do it again. Same at competition. I, 
our, our enemies are always greatest in our imagination. I joke about this in my live show. I go, I go to comp, I don't look at the guy's name, I don't know anything about him. And then I think, oh, I bet he's well hard. <laughs> and then I go, I bet he's been to prison. I bet he's been to prison twice. I bet he's killed someone. And then I meet them, I compete against them, they're the nicest people in the world. But the one saying from Hickson there was, when I step onto the mat with my incredibly sweaty feet from the anxiety of competing, this person can beat me, I can lose, but being defeated is my personal choice. And when people think about martial arts, let's say you go, oh, I'm inspired to go compete and you do a kickboxing tournament next week, someone kicks the fuck out of you, knocks you out in front of your family at a you know, white collar boxing event, whatever it is, you decide whether you've been defeated. You can't decide whether or not you lose. And to me, that was a very profound thing that I'm very keen to pass on to other people. Just one thing on this subject and then we'll move on. And that is, um, what if you're not asked about martial arts but you've still got body image issues? Do someone else. <laughs> so get good at something, is that the message? Yeah, and I think you should have some competency hierarchy that no one can take away from you, even if it's fucking chess, right? Something that, if you lose your business, you lose your family, whatever it is, there's something that's a backbone to your life that's not impacted. We said before offline about social media and being canceled. I must fight on an ongoing basis to ensure that I look at my social media as a tool that can help people, but I am not that tool, that tool is not me, and I must be prepared for it to be taken away. And you did say about being canceled, and the beautiful thing is, I now teach jujitsu once a week, and I fucking love it. And I think to myself, I've got enough in savings to open a dojo where I could have a small gym and mats. Uh, I'd hope to get my Australian visa because I'd do it in a small town somewhere. I then have the door knocking experience to knock on enough doors in a small town to convert enough people to come to my gym. I'd give them all a week free membership and I would, from that, build a business I could survive from. I'd be a very different person in 10 years than the current trajectory I'm on, but I would actually be okay with that. And I would still be arguably wealthier than most people if I did that. So again, it'd be a bit tougher teaching chess. <laughs> knocking on the door, hey, my name's James, I'm a local chess champion. <laughs> Do you wanna to come to my academy? Yeah. It'd be a bit different, but um, as you can tell, even me talking about it is something that I'm very passionate about. And, um, I, I feel like I've almost protected myself from the world going to shit by having that mentality. Mm. One more fitness related question and then we'll go into confidence. Okay. Talk fucking loads about your book and promote your book. It's all right, we got- Everywhere. We got the Sunday Times bestseller. So don't, don't push it too hard. Okay. Well, <laughs> maybe we have to go bigger. Yeah, but whatever you like. <laughs> um, what's the craziest thing you've ever seen in the fitness industry? Depends what you define as crazy. Uh, uh, it sounds crazy, but competing. I don't get it. And this, again, comes from a place of ignorance. A lot of people starve themselves. They can call it what they want, they starve themselves because they create some pretty weird relationships with food. They'll cook their favorite meal and freeze it for four weeks. These are unhealthy habits that people are doing. They then, if they naturally compete, go to a period where they lose their menstrual cycle or their dick stops working. Like, if my dick stopped becoming erect, I'd take that as a fucking hint that I wasn't eating enough. And they do it to parade and fake tan to impress other people. Now, it'd be very easy for them to go, well, you get sweaty and roll around people trying to choke each other out, and I get that. But for me, having that as the, you know, the pinnacle of fitness, to me, fitness is about what the body can accomplish and can do. And let's say we use CrossFit and competing. On the day you would compete in CrossFit, you'd perform your best. On the day you compete in physique, you perform your worst. And to me, that is paradoxical. It's almost like an oxymoron. Mm. But we would hold that in a high light and go, this is fitness, mm. which is what a lot of people, a lot of people that are obese and overweight will look into the fitness industry, see that and go, fuck that, I'd rather have type two diabetes. And that's what I think is crazy. So is much of the fitness industry a scam then in that regard? Some people love it, but the thing is, I've worked with quite a lot of coaches uh, to better their kind of fitness business, and they'll say, oh, I'm thinking about competing. And really what they're looking to do is be accepted by their peers, not to build confidence or make themselves a better person. So, you know, if I could, I've talked to a lot of people out of competing because People magnetize other people's values. I think in modern day society that happens a lot, and we'll get into that when it comes to like mortgages. A lot of people see their parents hold strong values about something, who arguably do come from a, a different world to them, and they make them their own and wonder why they feel a bit suffocated and why they're a bit unhappy or 
So let's say you get into the fitness industry, you think you need to compete to be taken seriously because all the other PTs in your gym competed. You're four weeks out feeling like you're gonna faint every time you get up and you're like, why do I feel this way? Because you're working towards someone else's values. They might hold that and cherish it as really, really important. And yeah, just to say to people, what do you want? Oh, I wanna feel good, I wanna train well, I wanna perform well. Well, that's not congruent with your value system that you're holding on to. So in some respects, yes, it can be a bit of a scam. So your book's called How to Be Confident. Mm -hmm. Can anyone be confident? I've kind of called bullshit on confidence uh, in some respects Ooh. because I kind of come up with the theory that whatever opportunities or kind of forks in the road present themselves in life, we have a path of action and inaction. It's very easy to continually choose a path of inaction and label yourself as someone that isn't confident. So let's say you are single, you didn't ask the person for the number, you didn't chat to them, you got asked to interview at a job that paid 20% more than what you do, you chose not to do it, you didn't want to do it. You know, all of these things kind of add up. And if you choose an action off the time, there's a label out there that fits me perfect. What is it? I'm just not a confident person. Whereas I think that their confidence sits on many different spectrums. For instance, we could say confidence and anxiety sit together. Anxiety is predicting an outcome of failure. Confidence is predicting an outcome of success. Then when we look at failure as a bigger picture, you know, confident people have a good relationship with failing, not a good relationship with success. Especially entrepreneurs. Like you have an entrepreneur that creates a business or a system and it's not working. They're okay with that. They don't take it to heart. Good entrepreneurs anyway. They can appreciate that something's not working. Whereas someone who's maybe looking to dip their foot into the entrepreneurial world of building a business, but they're so petrified and crippled by the idea of failing that they never actually get to accomplish anything. So then we can call confidence this, you know, magical way of being okay with failing. I also see, you tell them, media trained it. You can also, uh, there is a utility to failure that we don't talk about enough. So people see failure in a bad light. But with every failed attempt, we can develop competency. So I used to knock on doors for a living, selling gas and electric for NPower. I made a sale one in a hundred doors. Was I getting beaten up and deflated by the doors when people told me to fuck off? I was like, no, because I just got the opportunity to pitch to a stranger there. My heart rate is dropping with everyone. I'm pronunciating my words better. With every person that told me to fuck off, I should be grateful because they've set me up for a better pitch with the next person. So, you know, even the, this, so this big realm of confidence, is it a guise to an action? Is it because people have got a poor relationship with failure? Is it a bullshit excuse to, you know, not take the paths in life that people want to? And the book was a great opportunity for me to present biases that would potentially hinder people and a few theories that can help people choose the path of action. Is there an argument to say that everyone, no matter who they are, has areas of their life or parts of themselves where they have high confidence? Driving. Whether they are outwardly looking like a low confidence person and conversely, someone who outward, outwardly looks like a confident person has areas of their life that they're insecure and lack confidence in? 100%, so 93% of drivers. I'll pull my own, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was gonna think, what an arsehole. <laughs> I was trying to look cool. Uh, I was trying to do it like on the slide. Yeah, yeah. While I'm talking, sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. 93% of drivers rate themselves as above average. So like, for a straight, yeah. we're all over, like 75% uh, of uh, like DNA exoner exoneration, exoneration, where people are found to be innocent, not guilty, uh, is from faulty eyewitness testimonies. So human beings have the, the ability to be you know, overconfident machines, but you're completely right. If you said to me, right, James, you've got to do a 20 minute talk to 5,000 people, or you've got to go ask that girl in the red dress for a number, I'd be like, give me 10,000 people. You know, that, that to me is more comfortable. Whereas, especially because I have a girlfriend now, that'd be a bit, you know, I'd be very nervous. But, you know, so we all have gaping holes in confidence in different areas of our life where you have some people that, you know, might be slotting a kick for goal, you know, in a rugby stadium full of people, absolutely fine. Post-match interview, they can't get the words out. So, yeah, there's definitely different spectrums. I think even the most confident people have definitely got holes in there. And then on the flip side, yeah, people that are low confidence do have the ability to be overconfident. Even, you know, uh, one of my favorite biases is uh, the availability bias, where the information that we have available to us paints a picture of our reality. So I live on Bondi. People go, oh, you scared of sharks? Okay, well, way more likely to drown. 
And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, the people drive on there every day. See people pulled out the sea wearing jeans, <laughs> you know, like people that just got yeah. a little bit too close to the rip. They get resuscitated on the beach. I've never seen anyone get bitten by a shark. Again, taken off on a plane, and everyone's like, oh, shitting themselves about the plane. I'm like, your Uber drive here was way more dangerous than, you know, the plane taking off. So uh, if I was to say someone, you know, in a debate, what's the most dangerous source of power? They go, oh, nuclear. They've got a false sense of confidence through the information that's been made available to them. Whereas deaths per kilowatt, solar's much more dangerous because of people falling off roofs fit in the solar panels. So the information people have available to them skews their reality and it also gives them a false sense of confidence. So as much as people think and label themselves as not confident, they often have overconfidence in other areas, mm -hmm. whether they know it or not. So therefore, is confidence not a thing that is a persona? It's individual areas within our lives that we've either mastered or disowned. Yeah, and I mean, uh, if you go on to 16personalities.com, none of the personalities are confident. You know, they're not assigned to personality types. No. It's a perception of your reality. And but we make it about ourselves. You're a confident person because you do all your shows and you've written all your books and you're good on social media. The sweat, sweat patches otherwise. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not a confident person because I couldn't do that. Often mm. we pedestalize other people and think, wow, they're confident because they're so good, I could never do that, therefore I'm not confident. But that person might be really confident in chess, for example. Exactly, so it's a very good label. People do need a label for their own actions. They need something to lean back on as to why they're not doing things. It makes them feel better. So it's a, a, a validation for an excuse. 100%. Yeah. And, and there are some people that probably have got naturally very high levels of anxiety, and I'm not saying that, oh, mate, snap out of it. Yeah. I'm saying, or all of our start points are very different in life. And I think that, you know, confidence in some respects is a very easy excuse. There might be some people very much crippled by it. And I say as well, I have a theory, this isn't backed up by science, but when you look at dogs, right, you might have a very timid dog or a very confident dog. The timid dog has built a reality of experiences that have happened in its life. Maybe abusive owner when it was young, whatever, timid because every time it's gone near a human, it might have been hit or mistreated. Whereas dogs that grew up in my family household, nothing was a threat. They were always fed, looked after, throw a tennis ball for them. So when they went out to a busy road, they didn't see cars as a threat and it didn't end well for any of our dogs that got run over. So we must take into account that our starting points are very different because if you've been suppressed by your family, your friends, your loved ones, you've been shit talked about and bullied and you've experienced trauma and all of these things, that does hinder your perception on the reality. So it's not me going, just pick the path of action, mate. It's about taking note and taking stock of the fact that we all have these different start points. But, you know, whether you start at zero or you start at one, we still need to appreciate and have the same kind of values and, and you know, perception of the outside world. And yeah, really all you're trying to do, you're not trying to make anyone a superhero, you're trying to make them reach their full potential. So is there an upside benefit of lacking confidence? Society rewards confidence. I think society also rewards overconfidence uh, in, in some respects. Is there a utility to not having a lot of confidence apart from potential humility? I'm not sure. Or, I, or not overt public failure, which thousands of years ago would have been a bit of an issue, wouldn't it? Yeah, and I mean, this whole failure thing as well. Before, back in the day, back in the day, we used to fail legitimate, uh, we used to fear legitimate things. Now, really all we're fearing is embarrassment, rejection, uh, you know, anything that's going to damage our self-esteem, things not going right. You know, before it was like famine, <laughs> tyranny, war, tribal warfare, whatever it is. <laughs> so like our, our fear Public systems... Public flogging and yeah, stoning. Stoning to death. <laughs> yeah. So our, our fear systems are very much, you know, probably overactive for a lot of these things. And uh, Tim Ferriss famously, I love this part of the book because I read Tim Ferriss asking about 10% off a coffee. And I remember reading it, I was like, oh, that's quite a good point. And then I referenced it in the book, and I was like, I can't put this in the book without doing it. And I tried to get across to people, you don't ask 10% off a coffee to get 10% off, you do it so you look like a dickhead in front of everyone, and that it's embarrassing, and that you'll get rejected. And so I was in Sydney, in Wynyard, I know exactly the coffee shop, time of day, everything, and asking for that 10% off was one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. And that was much more uncomfortable than talking to big shows or doing a podcast or whatever. It was only afterwards that I realized it wasn't as bad as I thought. And we all experience this in our life, whether we approach a stranger or we ask for a promotion or we interview. So that sense of relief when we come out, and we should really take stock and evidence of how 
in hindsight, things are never as bad as we perceive. Our imagination builds things up to be much, much worse than they are in reality. And uh, there's a quote in Ryan Holiday's most recent book about um, about 100 years ago, there's a story of a uh, some Ameri- How come you've read everyone's fucking book except mine? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I do need to read it. Um, I'm just playing. It's good. Like, uh, and he says that they could hear wolves and they're walking through like high grass and there's like, oh, there's enough wolves here. We're all going to get killed and devoured. And it turns out it's just two wolves making all the noise. And they say there are always more wolves until they're counted. And it's one of those things in life where mm. until you appreciate that your enemy is always greater until you count them, you're, you know, uh, all of the things that you fear in life are only as bad as your imagination makes them. And then in hindsight, you realize they were never as bad as you thought before. Is it easy for a privileged white male to talk about confidence? Potentially so. I've never lived the life of anyone different. So there could be a sense of, um, you know, naivety and ignorance to it. Now, this is a sensitive one because it's a top topic I get cancelled on. I want to do, uh, I'm hopefully going to- Well, do you, didn't you call them woke? I don't think I've said that on my podcast. I think I've only said that word once live in 16 years. I wouldn't do it. Woke isn't that what you called them? Yeah, I got called uh, uh, someone. I was talking about something and someone commented saying... Harry, you better beat that out just on yeah. me. Not on James, just on me. Someone said, uh, it's okay for you. You're a cisgender, white, straight male. And that annoyed me a lot because there's a lot of effort that I put into the point to get that criticism. And my response was, maybe I outworked you for a decade. Maybe. And this caused all kind of hysteria online. And the point was valid. And a lot of people were like, yeah, maybe he did do more. Because hard work, thank you very much for the mind up. Hard workers will never show you how hard they're working. It's like one of the biggest- Too busy fucking working. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And do you know what? I would say that I acknowledge some privilege in the respect that my mum and dad are still together. To me, that's a massive privilege. Mm. I am privileged in the sense that, you know, my dad worked in the same company for 50 years to the point that they're still in the home that I grew up in, so I have a bedroom. So right now I'm staying in that bedroom. If my parents had split or my dad downsized or you know hadn't been financially smart or even to the point of being so consistent with his work life, I wouldn't be in the position to just come back and go, hey, I wanna stay with you. So there are some things I'm definitely privileged about. I'm privileged in the sense of when I was born because being born in 1989 meant that at 26, which was a perfect age of just being mature enough to get a point across, but being young enough not to be past it, the video sensation on social media took off. So there are so many things I'm privileged for, but I, I joke, and again, I could be ill-hearted saying this, if I was gay, I'd be using that to an advantage, right? I would have the gay community, I'd be the gay PT. You know, I'd, I'd be using that as a niche. Some say you could pull that off anyway. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it is crazy, the left and the wokest kind of mentality is crazy. I, I did a jiu-jitsu instructional, like a short video, and I'm mounting a guy and my crutch is quite close to his face. And I made the title, it's not what you think. So then people go, what is it? You know, inquisitively I wanted to appease to them. And someone in the comments goes, you're gay baiting? I say, excuse me? He goes, you're gay baiting. You're a straight man and you're performing what is perceived as a, a gay action. Therefore you're misleading the gay community. And I was like, wow. Like I said, mate, I'm, I'm really sorry, but do you know that I'm not gay? And they put this long paragraph, he was like, I'm so sorry, you know, I didn't mean to assume your sexual I was like, what's going on here? Then we saw a, a tweet going viral with Jamila Jamil recently, where she goes, someone was given a grief on Twitter and she misgendered the person. And she goes, the standard on Twitter is not good enough. You now must put your pronouns, not just in your pronoun area, but in your name on Twitter, so that people don't have to go to your profile to know your pronouns. And then someone else comes in below her and goes, no, 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 how dare you put that back on the person who you misgendered as their fault. You should have done the due diligence to go look at their pronouns in their bio. Don't use your laziness to go into the the profile to find out their pronouns. Then someone else comes in and says, you've used the word non-binary incorrectly. You've used the word NB, which the black community you." And this Twitter warfare that went on, I was like, the left are absorbing the left. Sometimes when I do get the the leftists and the woke coming for me, I think I might just leave them alone so they can eat themselves and consume themselves. And then what I should have done probably a bit more classily was to sit back and just try and get in the the headspace of where that person was. And again, it would all be too confident for them to look at me and see any form of success and go, he's white, he's, he's male, 
He's straight, no brainer. Mm. But um, yeah, and like I say, I've never lived life as anything different. And I, I almost feel in some respects, I shouldn't be punished for that. And I think it is. It's kind not of, your fault you were born who you are. Yeah, and then yeah. people try and sometimes put things on you that have happened in history. And I'm like, whoa, I wasn't alive then. You know, oh, but it was your, you know, your ancestors. And you're, and you're like, where are we going with this? You know, it, it does seem to me like a pretty tyrannic ideology that yeah. has been created where you can never be woke enough. And unfortunately, with the political landscape splitting, you do see, you know, even people down that are in the center, they're like, oh, extreme, far right. Um, it, sometimes it just makes me not want to engage in it at all. No. Um, but yeah. Why do you think the political landscape and the left and the right has got so divided and extreme? Probably social media, to be honest, and you know, tactics of polarization. I use polarization as, as a marketing tool where you know, my facetious, facetious, crass nature of doing blunt videos with swear words is to you know, really polarize people that aren't gonna be right for me away and then I tactically will have little prods at vegans and keto communities and things like that so that I can, in essence, save them time and money. What I don't want is them to join my program or whatever and not be right or to buy a book and think I'm ignorant. Are you also doing it to try and get more views and more reach? Have yeah. You, yeah, you figured out that it gets you more views and yeah, reach. Yeah, ultimately. And it was by accident that I figured this out. I used to do a little whiteboard. Say I'd have a, a client cancel. I'd go into the PT room, I'd get a whiteboard out with a pen, I'd put my phone on the side, go live. Hey guys, here's calories, here's your macros, here's your protein, blah, blah, blah. And then something would annoy me. I'd go into the PT room and I'd be like, this is fucking bullshit. And then the views, woo. And I was like, what's going on here? Similar to, you know, at school, you know, if someone's doing something amazing, no one goes over, you know. You might have the best Pokemon cards at school, no one cares. There's a fight, people are legging it to watch the fight. <laughs> so there's that primitive, combative part of our mind that just loves seeing shit go south. Mm. So then over time, you know, I do 10 videos, which ones did the best? The ones where I had too much coffee, cool. So I do 10 videos having too much coffee, which ones do best? The ones where I'm bagging people out, cool. Bag 10 people out, which ones do the best when you go after the charlatans? So you do get these kind of systems in place and you are gonna piss people off, but ultimately I'm too focused on the systems that I use for business and marketing to, you know, to really worry. I mean, even yourself with your businesses and there are going to be entrepreneurs and business owners and people in that space that don't like what you're doing, but ultimately they're not people that are going to come to your business events or people that are going to respect you enough to, to buy a book. Mm. I will read the book, by the way. I will read it. I've written 18, so... <laughs> Which one was the one that my business partner, James Shaw, was talking about? It would about? probably either be money or life money. leverage. That's it, yeah, money. Yeah, um, that's so I'm not offended, it's all good. He said to I'm me, not woke left, I'm not offended. He said to me, but the, this is it, because of your approach being like, oh, I don't mind if you read it after, I'll read it now. But if you're like, you gotta read my book, I'm like, I'm never gonna do it. <laughs> but, yeah. So we, we, I initially started the conversation about why has the political landscape got, got so divided and polarized, and you said social media, and you figured out polarization works for reach. When you said social media, are you also saying social media encourages polarization? Yeah, because it rewards that confrontation. It rewards the extreme nature of, of things. I'm, I'm not sure if the statistic of fake news traveling faster than true news is actually sound, but I think from a standpoint, it probably is. So, you know, there's what, three truths in life. You've got uh, personal truths, objective truths, and political truths. So personal truth, it's true because it feels to you like it is. I think this is Neil deGrasse Tyson's, by the way. So if you believe Jesus... It's another one, another book you've read of somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, you know, uh, if it's personal truth, it's true to you. So God is real to a Christian, Allah is real to someone from Islam. You can't say to someone that's not true because it's their personal truth. You've got objective truth, you know, the speed of light is whatever. Um, but then you've got political truths where things become true through repetition. So, you know, we've seen Trump do this very effectively with like Hillary Clinton or whatever. So, you know, people play into that landscape. They play into the virality of mm. people wanting to see shit go south, people playing into that. And, you know, the algorithms, however intelligent they are, if someone's starting a fire on the internet, the algorithms want to make that a bushfire. They want to make it a massive widespread fire. And that is what I think causes a lot of polarization. Now you can't sit in two camps especially the left, they're like, you're either with us or against us. You know, if you were a 
a political left person or you're a liberal and you like Jordan Peterson, they're like, no, you can't have both. So what, you can't be a liberal and like Jordan Peterson? They're like, no, get out, we're in. Too late, we've cancelled you. <laughs> <laughs> we found a tweet from 2011. And that's another thing as well that I don't like is, you know, yeah. people change. And I'm very- And the way the world was back then changes. And I'm very different to how I was a year ago, even six months ago. And I don't like the fact that one of the left's tactics for cancellations is to go back in time. Because, you know, we mature, we're all been young. I've done dumb shit when I was younger. I will continue to do just maybe a little bit less dumb shit. And I don't like the, the fact that people are digging up graves in the point to win an argument. Mm. And social media like that has, has caused a lot of issues where people have found tweets from 15 years ago. And to be fair, that makes me sick a little bit that people go to that extent. The Molly May incident on uh, Stephen Bartlett's podcast. Yeah, that blew up. He put out the podcast for a year, no one cared. And then yeah. suddenly they're digging it up. Uh, yeah, and, and also what she said made good practical sense that we do all have 24 hours in a day. That's a fact. Yeah, so that's an objective truth. That's not a personal truth. I think it's 23 hours, <laughs> 58 yeah, minutes. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, there's, it's always a worry. But I do think it's social media. I do think that politicians are levering this more than ever. Especially, you know, if you can't raise your own profile, put someone else's down, which I've been mm. guilty of before. Yeah. So what's to blame though, the algorithms or the people? Because if you think about it, algorithms can only gain people in a way that people's minds work. If we didn't react to all the extremism, extremism wouldn't work. Oh, we're to blame just as much. Again, with the whole confidence thing, it's easy to blame. Social media, it's also easy to blame. Yeah. Oh, the algorithm. Fucking yeah, algorithm. Fucking meta. I've said it. that loads of times. <laughs> <laughs> why, why is the world hating each other? Not, not humans. It's no. obviously AI. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Right. Um, do you struggle with confidence yourself? At times. Like, not oh, sorry. One more thing. Let me go back. Um, trolling online versus face to face. So you call people out, um, but if you had three very left people here, would you call them all woke? Or would, would you be I'd more wait. polite face to face than you are on your on I'll social probably, media? I'll give them the respect until, you know, I, I would respect everyone. I think online it's quite cool to throw, you're abrasively throwing things into the fire. And then when that fire explodes, you don't have to be there. Just put your phone down. <laughs> so a lot of the time people are like, oh, have you seen the response video? I'm like, no. And then they're like, are you gonna watch it? I was like, no. Like, so sometimes I'm just literally a bit of petrol in the fire and I leave it. <laughs> if people are in the room, I'd actually like to probably try and have an objective conversation because mm. it's easier to understand someone when you're looking eye to eye with them. Mm. Whereas online, people don't want to learn. They don't want to find a middle ground. They're throwing petrol on from their side. Yeah. We're throwing it on from mine. So yeah, uh, no, I wouldn't, I'm never rude to anyone. And if anyone criticizes me, I've only ever had one bad experience with someone face to face. And I just politely asked them to leave the table we're drinking at because Someone, I was drinking in Sydney uh, near the Opera House and I think it was two girls and a guy went past and we're on a big table like this. And I said, hey, join us if you want. Like, you know, we're not precious. Just please don't record anything we say and put it on the internet. So we're currently shit talking one of our mates. <laughs> and they joined us and uh, one of the girls, one of the weirdest ones, she just started going in on one of my friends saying he was riding the coattails or something like that. And I was like, I was like, would you fuck off? <laughs> you know, and I just said, please can leave the table. That's the most horrible interaction I've ever had in real life because people are very different behind screens. Yeah, this, is, this was where I was digging really. Shouldn't be digging with questions, I should just be asking them, but the fact that we can sit behind a computer now, we can be much more brave and aggressive with our opinions. And It's like the car syndrome, isn't it? When someone's angry at you in a car and then you stop and then they get out and they're like, oh, you're all of a sudden really nice. There's, some, there's a really strong correlation that I'm fascinated with, with uh, people being on their own and the levels of aggression. So. We rarely experience road rage when we're in the car with people. It's when we're isolated on our own and we've been together for a long period of time. We also saw the people being locked down and confined to their own homes made people very angry. And I seem to think that the, the more you segregate people and isolate them, the angrier they become. Right. So I believe that the majority of people that are trolling or being mean online are very lonely people. Yeah. And lonely people don't find themselves in social settings, nor do they have the confidence being in a group. So I think that the people that give you the most shit would never confront you, one, because they're on their own. Two, they're probably not out and about. They're probably just at home. They've probably got their job and then they're home. Yeah. And then they don't really exist much outside that. So all I need to do is spend 30 seconds after seeing a comment and flip it into being a position I feel sorry for someone. Yeah. Like, the only person I shit talk about is my best mate and I put it in his comment section and he always does it to me. If I post something an hour later, I'm like, what's he said? And he said, so it's got like 300 likes. I'm like, you bastard. 
So yeah, <laughs> I think that if anyone out because people were shit talking or criticizing you or saying bad things to make themselves feel better, mm. that's it. Yeah. No one's doing it to make so themselves feel better. Yeah. yeah. And I look at that and I go, wow. And sometimes I do bag them out. I go, hey mate, I hope your life gets better. Or you know, whatever it was that hurt you today, I hope it fixes itself. Because then you get to rip them and get your point across at the same time. <laughs> Or if, or if people unfollow you, I'm like, it's not a fucking airport, no need for a departure. You, know, you don't need to announce it. So yeah, there's always a way to flip that. Yeah. So yeah, that question, um, do you struggle yourself with confidence? Yes, less than ever, because I feel like as I go through life, I'm putting more experiences in my bank of memories as to where I've, I've managed to get out of scenarios with a positive outcome. So for instance, podcasting, you know, TV, radio, all those things that still do make me nervous. I still do get, you know, performance anxiety, but I've, I've collated quite a lot of previous experiences so that I can build a good case for myself that I should be all right. And if it all goes wrong, it should be okay. Mm. Um, weirdly, I think that, like I said before, even I'm, I'm confident with life because if everything was to get taken away from me, I feel like I have the tools to build it back up in some respect, which is why I think it's important to weaponize people I mean, weaponize people, how do you mean? Even uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a physical standpoint, whatever it is. So people's abilities need to be weaponized. So let's say you're heavily reliant on a structure of being employed. If you had everything taken away from you from your job, you could be in a very like nihilistic existence of like hating the so world. So skill yourself up basically. Yeah. yeah. But if you teach someone the fundamentals of sales, marketing, business operations, you could you know, grab them out of their comfortable life and put them somewhere else in the world. Suddenly you're in the south of France and you've got to make it work. They'd go, oh, this is really shit, but let's think of a way I can start something from scratch. And um, yeah, so I think in, in some respects that makes me confident. Yeah. And I'm happy in, for things not to go right. I Happy or okay with? No, it's, it's weird because I'm happy with the constant, I was saying to you before offline actually, that I'm constantly dissatisfied with my efforts, but that makes me happy because it keeps me driven, it keeps me motivated. I couldn't imagine anything worse than retiring. So you're saying happiness is constant drive rather than arrive at a destination of feeling perennially happy? They say the man that loves to walk will walk further than the man that loves the destination. And I think that's, I've never wanted to be a millionaire. Some people say that and I'm like, it's very destination based. Uh, and I think I'm definitely privileged as someone that loves the journey. That is a place of privilege. Yeah. And I did a seminar in front of about 500 PTs a couple of weeks ago. I was like, you are the luckiest fucking people on the planet. You're working a job you like, top percent. You work for yourself, top percent. You get to control the variables of your business. You guys are in the top fraction of fucking people on the planet. I was like, you may have less money than other people, but you guys are fucking wealthy because there are bankers in Canary Wharf hate their life, stressed out, and they earn more than most people. So like, that I think is something that, yeah, definitely gives me confidence with it. And it doesn't have to be, external people could say, oh, it's maybe your financial status or your social status or any of these things, it's not those things. I feel to me it's confident that I have the constituents of a good life. And if some of those constituents went away, I feel like I could get them back. Did writing a book called How To Be Confident make you more confident or less confident? Probably made me seem like a bit of an arsehole, if I'm honest. Like, it, well, I didn't pick the title. Um, Your marketing department did. <laughs> no, publishers, publishers. Yeah, I, I did that. They I like, fucking hate it when my publishers come in too hard on angle. But they said, uh, they presented the title and I was like, I could do that. It wasn't like I know, I didn't say, oh, I know that. I said, I could do that. I could assimilate all the information I believe that could help people. What, would, what book would you have written that wasn't pushed by the publisher. We're talking about this now actually, where we were saying, I was saying to you before that the demographic of people that I talk to is changing and I've got a lot more men followers than I've ever had before. And now I'm 33, which is still young. My male following in their low twenties, I keep having the same conversations with them about their lives. I'd love to write a book, and this is again, I'll be canceled for being a sexist. I wanna to talk to young men. And I want to talk to guys that were where I was at 21. Hey, don't do steroids. You don't need to. Get your natural potential. You don't need a six pack. You know, get fit, get strong, lift your fucking weights. Girls will love you for it either way. You know, no girl is going to dump you for not having a six pack. And if she does, you're with the wrong person. 
I'd like to say to them, you know, find something, it doesn't have to be passionate, but find something that you could do that could potentially be your own business. Because being your own business owner or running your own business, even if it was fucking drop shipping on Amazon, you create this aura amongst your spirit, which sounds kind of like very hippie. And I was like, not having to report to a boss, because reporting to a boss and being micromanaged kills your soul. Like it, it literally hindered my state of well-being when you know my boss would be like, oh, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. And it wasn't something I enjoyed. It was like recruitment or sales or something like that. Just remember that's your truth, not objective. Truth. Yes, of course. I yeah. have nearly 200 staff, so I hope they're not no, fucking no, no, listening like, to this. Like, um, so, so some of these young guys, because I'd be talking to myself. Yeah. There are some people that are happy for the security, similar to being secure in other areas of life. There are a lot of guys that read my second book that kind of resonated with it. They're like, oh, I, I want to do something for myself. I'd rather get paid less, but do my own thing. And then I'd probably say to them as well, just about, you know, values, maybe traveling the world, getting out and about. Um, I was pretty reckless in my 20s as far as, if you had to put an objective pair of goggles on to what the smart thing is doing in your 20s, I didn't do any of it. But I managed to come out on top. And I'm not saying this is a blueprint for people to follow. This is a blueprint for people that have resonate, resonated with my journey. Mm. I'd love to write a book for them and just say these, these kind of lessons that I could have done with a few years earlier. I'm kind of grateful they didn't. And I'm in the gym and guys will come over. I'd be like, oh, James called, can I get a picture? I'm like, sweet. I'm like, what'd you do? They're like, oh, I work in insurance. I'm like, do you like it? They're like, oh, not really. I'm like, how old are you? They're like, I'm 24. What do you want to do? They're like, be a PT. Yeah. And then I'm like, why don't you do it? They're like, oh, my job pays well. And I go, yeah, cool, keep doing it. Five years, you'll probably have a chick pregnant and you'll be living in a housing estate, you know, a couple of miles out of town because, you know, you, you might not be able to reach the heights of whatever. And then they kind of have that little moment. They go, fuck, my life is happening before my eyes. And I'm not convincing someone. I'm not like brainwashing them. Three, two, one, you're in the room. I'm just giving them the advice that sometimes they would need. And they go, oh, I've been to Australia a few years ago. I did my one year work in holiday visa. I love it. I always wanted to go back. Another guy, I go, how old are you? Because I'm 31. I go, well, after 33, the visa rules change. You need to go in the next two years. I go, you got a girlfriend? They go, no. I go, oof, it's never going to get easier than now. And those bits of advice that I love, because I've also bumped into people in Australia that are like, I read your book, I moved to Oz, I'm the happiest I've ever been. So I'd love to write something to those people. Mm. Well, I want to come back to the book bit, because it's fascinating, but do you think men have become more unfulfilled and emasculated? Uh... I think they've been appreciated less. And that's very much a Jordan Peterson kind of thing. Appreciated right? less for being a man. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, like, I'm very fortunate. I come from a very traditional household. My dad worked, my mum looked after me and my sister. And I'm very glad it was that way around, not the other way around, because my dad only knows how to make toast. But uh, yeah, it kind of feels like what used to be a virtue for a man is now a sin. And I'm not too sure about that. And you know, more that worries me is the landscape that I think it's amazing that women are getting better educated than ever. But there are repercussions to that, like having kids later, like, uh, you know, more women are having children after 30 than before 30 for the first time in history. Uh, so there are all these kind of things that happen in the landscape. And as women get better educated, suddenly there's a smaller pool of men that they're going to marry because women like to marry someone of the same intelligence or above. So. There's a kind of weird thing happening at the moment, which is, I'm not so sure about, and even looking at masculine characters in films, diminishing, <laughs> suddenly, you know, you don't have alpha males, like, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger back in the day, like Commando, ki Kindergarten <laughs> yeah. Cop, all these cool films, like Sylvester Stallone, like, yeah, going in. This, this isn't happening, like masculinity is um, not so much rewarded as it's been before. and. I can't remember who said it. I think it might have been Tony Robbins that said it. Good times make weak men. Uh, weak men make tough times. Tough times make strong men. Strong men make good times and so forth. Mm. And I do feel like we're in a, a point in time where we're rewarding uh, weak men. And Tim Kennedy, who uh, went on Joe Rogan, MMA guy, Special Forces, um, he said that when he went to Ukraine recently, a few months ago, he goes, no one's fat. He goes, no one's overweight. He goes, they're ready, and they've been ready. And he says, the Russians very much underestimated this. And he goes, there's an aura amongst the people there. And you go there, and I don't think they potentially care about masculinity or alpha males or whatever, because they know that there's gonna be an impending war. They need men for that. But I think in maybe other parts of Western society where we feel like 
nothing like that would ever happen on our doorstep. We don't want to reward manly men with being men. And with the physique thing as well, we've moved, I'm not discrediting any changes in the female landscape, but for men, 20 years ago, you come home with an empty lunchbox, a hairy chest, and you swing an ax and you can chop a tree. You're enough to support the family, you know? Now it's like, nah, we need to shave the chest, you need to have a six pack, you need to have your, your beard trimmed perfectly, you need to have a, your aftershave on, you need to be, what, you're wearing cheap aftershave, you know? So it is a time that is definitely concerning with that landscape, but to, to whether where it's gonna go, I don't know, but it is an interesting one where men are definitely getting a tough time and even to say that is suddenly to discredit all of the issues that females have had with like women's rights and misogyny and all of these things. So it's something you have to tiptoe about, but in the bid to try and make the world a better place, I don't think we should be putting men down. Mm. I did a video today actually reacting to a TikTok uh, of someone saying the difference having hair makes, it's Prince Charles, Prince Charles, not Prince Charles, Prince William. And since he lost his hair, they were like before, after, and the after was with the hair. They were like, oh my God, having hair on a man changes them so much for the better. So I took that and I was like, fucking hell. I was like, ladies, can you not do this? Because there are some things out of you know, control for men. One being hair loss, two being height. And these are two things that you're hugely categorizing men on. Most women on dating apps have their preference for height over six foot. And that's suddenly 15% of the population. So 85% of men now are swiping and they won't even get a response because they're not tall enough. And that's not even a predictor for longevity in a relationship, someone's height. So you're like, fucking hell, don't do that. And then with hair loss, the amount of people going to Turkey to get like hair transplants, I'm like, you're, you're really building the insecurities of men when really you should be like, we should be all working together at the end of the day. We all need men and women to get on. And it really annoys me to see shit like that because that will impact and negate the self-esteem of men out there and to accomplish what? Like, what are people gonna do? Meditate and make their hair grow longer? No, like, there are, there are other virtues and things that, you know, there's, Again, another TikTok, I've been in the vortex too much of. <laughs> this woman was sticking up for men on a feminist podcast. She goes, oh, so you want a guy that's six foot? That's 15% of the population. You want him to have his own business? You can half it. You want him to be single? You can half it again. You want him to you know, be close to his family? Half it again. She goes, 100% of women fighting for a percentage, fraction of a percentage of the population of men isn't healthy for society. So, yeah. How does this change? I don't know. I don't know. But one, men do need to, and when men stick up for each other, or even me sticking up for uh, Prince William then, I'm not chatting shit about women. I'm not putting women mm. down. I'm not being misogynistic. I'm going, hey, can you not do that? Then they've gone, yeah, but men have said bad things about women for years on it. And I'm like, well, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm saying, just please don't do that. If you want to, you know, call someone an arsehole because he's being an arsehole, you go ahead. I'll beat you to it. But at the end of the day, let's, yeah, not, you know, men aren't invincible. Mm. Men do have feelings. Men do suffer with self-esteem images just as much as women. And uh, it's one of those things that if we try and, what I don't like is the fact that two genders, sorry, I get fucking canceled for that. Being male and female, <laughs> right? There are seven. You have to be a good guy, are you there today? Are over 70, there are over 70 genders, guys, you bigots. So. <laughs> For some reason, we're trying to uh, merge male and female together to like a unison of, you know, anyone can do anything. But those gender differences, I believe, are a synergy that allows this kind of like lubrication between the two genders to coexist. And dismantling that, to me, I don't think is a, is a good thing. I want equal opportunity for all, but it's a quality of outcome that, uh, you know, that another hot JP topic. It, it's a tough one. I want everyone to be able to do whatever they want in their lives. I want people to be, have the free spirit to do whatever they want, be in love with whoever they want. In some respects, I'm quite liberal with my standing on that. But let's not disintegrate society in a bid to try and make the world a better place. And let's not, you know, I would never dream of putting down a woman and I never dream, I wouldn't want a woman to put down a man. It goes both ways. And I think mm. the more people can do that, the better we can all get on. Do you self-sabotage context? We were talking before the, and um, we went live, and it was interesting how it sounded like you sometimes make things a bit more difficult for yourself than they would need to be on purpose, and I find that a fascinating discussion. Context over. Yeah, Do you so, self-sabotage? Yeah, like I was saying to you before, 
Um, I'm not very entrepreneurial in the sense that I don't really like investments. And I don't like the mentality in some respects. And I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying that, you know, there's a, a, the famous story of the fisherman and the businessman where the fisherman is out happily fishing. The businessman comes over and goes, you should catch more fish so that you can save more money so you can get more boats. And the guy said, then what? Oh, with more boats, you could create like a fishing empire. Then what? You could sell it and make loads of money. And then what? And he goes, oh, we well, could spend your days fishing. And like some people out there are so hungry with these investments and property portfolios. And if they love doing that and they're passionate about it, that's fine. But it's become a blueprint for everyone. And when I look at a market where everyone's getting the same advice, I become a bit skeptical. Like everyone's saying, buy a home, then what? So you can own it. Cool, you can pay it off in 30 years. And I'm like, okay. Well, every American influencer says you should rent, not buy. I don't, and I wouldn't say that either. I'm not the opposite. I, I did this once, you know, like the whole breakfast thing. I was like, breakfast isn't as important as you think. And then I became anti-breakfast as a byproduct. <laughs> I'm not that person. With it, I think that people, I, just, I would get any young person and go, what do you want to do? And I had someone uh, at, at an event say he'd inherited 10 grand. And I was like, do you know what you want to do with your life? He was like, no. I was like, fucking go traveling. Read some fucking books, man. Like, it could be the worst advice I ever give you. It could be the best. But... Ultimately, if he doesn't want to go traveling, he won't listen to that advice, I'd like to think. And for so many people, the default is invest. But I feel like... It's... I think for so many people, that isn't the default. I think 90 massive percent of the population don't even know how to invest. I don't even... Maybe you've created a... Maybe an echo chamber. Yeah, because you're around maybe a lot of influencers or maybe a lot of people who are moving up in their life but you know for example most people they keep their money in a savings account that's not an investment that's going down hard with inflation yeah the main thing i want to say and again like i say i'm talking to a younger version of myself yeah. so you're basically you're talking to your niche yeah yeah like um it just never really excited me and for me i'd rather build a business where in a few years time i could put down the majority of the deposit for a house or even buy it outright like this whole like but I don't like, I've never been in debt. I've, I've been, I lived in overdraft for a long time, but it was interest free. I don't like the idea of borrowing money. I don't like the idea of paying banks interest. I don't like the idea of, you know, being in debt to someone for long periods of time. I think that I can either afford something or I can't. And for me, whilst I have that period of not that much money in my bank account, I don't really want to, you know, get a property here. It's not a dream home. It's not where I want to live. I'm not interested. For some people, it's a great idea because they buy 10 houses in an area they're never going to go to and they rent them out or whatever. But to me, I feel like that energy could go elsewhere. And I don't like the idea of passive income. I like to work for my money. I like to send an email and then at the end of the week, see my efforts uh, gratified with financial earnings from it. And there's the virtue as well of every penny I've earned so far is from education. So you either come to a talk, you buy a book or you join my academy. Everything I earn is from education. So if there's not a lot of money in my bank account at the end of the week, I've not been educating people hard enough. So I'm um, also at the imposter syndrome thing. I'm a personal trainer. I coach people, they pay me for my services. So I don't really ever want to identify as like a property, you know, I am a property investor, or like, you know, I've got a hundred properties. Every person I've met that's got hundreds of houses or whatever, I'm like, I don't envy them. Because I said to you offline, I don't even like expensing things. Like, you know, someone go, oh, you can expense that meal. I'm like, meh. Like, you know, if I'm there on my computer or on my phone, like getting every penny back, I'm like, I could be doing something productive right now. I like the idea, I want to get to a point where I don't care about stuff like that. I don't want my business partners to go, what, what's this on the receipt, you know? Just spend it, like, I want to be reckless in some respect because it motivates me. I know when I wake up the next day, I'm like, I need to work today because I'm a reckless person that doesn't invest money and I spend my money on things that make me happy. And I think I'm always in the back of my mind, pessimistic with the outcome that, who says I'm going to live till 40? Who says I'm going to live till 50, you know? and then people go, oh, but you could leave the properties to your kids or your girlfriend or your family. Yeah, or I could just bring them up to, you know, be the same person I am. Hey, work hard, earn money, don't get too carried away with investing. <laughs> you know, so they, they could be wired very differently to me. So, you How know, does this link to self-sabotage? Well, you reckon that my uh, lack of investment could be a self-sabotaging means of me not doing it because I feel that if I was to invest, I would get a passive income, then I might become lazy and complacent. So I'm in this vicious circle, you were hypothesizing that maybe I'm self-sabotaging my entrepreneurial efforts so that I don't ever get in a position where I could discover a lazy version of myself. 
Mm. Mm. My, ba- my business partner will periodically go into our bank accounts and just move a fucking load of money, like seven figures or high six figures into other accounts and just won't tell me. And then I'll be like, fucking hell, bank account's not looking so great. And three months later, we've brought in a load of money and then he just moves it back. He loves to fucking play around with money. There is something to be said for, I call it the lean mindset. You know, if you're hungry, you're going to go and get food. So if you trick yourself into not being too comfortable, because they say comfort is the enemy of greatness, don't they? Then I think that's really motivating. But you probably don't know this because you haven't read my fucking books. But everything you said about what you hate is what I am. <laughs> so uh, I have hundreds of properties. I really believe in investing. It's just interesting to hear someone with a different view. So I had a, a magic mushroom trip about a year ago. Where That's episode two for us, is it? it well, like this, <laughs> but this is the, the kind of cool thing about it. So we went and um, we like went to a shop before and we got loads of like nice fruit. We're by the beach, we're in Bondi. So we went to like a nice fruit shop, we bought loads of fruit and we made a fruit platter. So when we came back from tripping, we could eat loads of food. When we get back from the trip, we sat there all high as fuck on magic mushrooms. And I, I say to my friend, there's loads of watermelon. I was like, I don't like watermelon. My friends are like, what? You don't like watermelon? I was like, no, I just don't like it. Well, then, what do you mean don't like it? I was like, when I eat it, I don't like the sensation I get in my brain. Like, That's crazy. So we're eating away and I'm eating uh, pineapple. And the same guy goes, I don't like pineapple. And I was like, whoa. I was like, guys, if we all like the same fruit and we all dislike the same fruit, there would just be pineapple here and everyone would be fighting for the melon. I said the diversification of our tastes, needs and likes is what allows us to complete this platter and all be happy. So in some respects, I think it's great because now there's more properties for you to buy because I'm not buying them. So I, I like this. this just keep saying, let's just keep promoting this on the podcast. So like, um, so in that respect. And notice I'm not trying to change your mind. No, no, no. And, yeah. and same, I'm like, I'm saying this, it's brilliant that we disagree on these kind of things. Mm. And with all due respect as well, like I have a similar thing where my manager is more like my older brother. He, uh, everything we earn, he has in an account. I have a card for it, but I don't know the pin. Like everything's there. I don't want to know how much is in there. I don't want to care. I actually don't even feel like I've earned it. And I quite like that. And he says to me, one day, we'll get your dream home in Bondi. But I'll tell you when we have enough money. I'm like, cool. I have no idea how much is in there. I don't even know how to check the account. I was supposed to be sent a letter to check. He could be, he could have run off with it. He could have been buying his own properties and with it. And you wish you'd have invested it. <laughs> then, I'll, then I'll be very hungry to work even harder. True lean mindset. Lean mindset. So yeah. um, there is that. There is like money that's being saved for a good cause, whatever. But uh, with my Australian business, where my business partner aggressively saves as well, I have a pretty moderate salary and I live off that. And it's the exact same. That amount of money I have a week is enough that I live well, but it's also not too much that I become complacent. So, you know, I haven't had a dividend in about a year and I've had a great year. Like, it's not like, I've earned considerably less money this year because we're investing into building a new app than I've ever earned in the last five years. But my life's still great. I still love it. I don't wake up with a fear or an existential fear that I'm not been smart enough with my money. And do you know what? In 10 years, we might have this conversation. You go, James, welcome back on the podcast. And I go, I oh, fucked up. And I'll say, I'm back with my parents, but not in a good way, you know? But yeah. I kind of embrace being wrong. I'm okay with being wrong. Mm. And, you know, let's say I completely fuck everything. I, I lose all my savings. I move back in my parents, probably in an old people's home at this point. Then I can instill that into my kids. I go, kids, your dad thought he knew best and he didn't buy a fucking home. So, it's an interesting one. I'll fall on the sword for him. Plus, they shouldn't be inheriting a big house in Bondi. They'll grow up spoiled little twats. So then, <laughs> I'm only really messing. But like Daniel Craig, I think it was said. Yeah, uh, quite a few people do that. And I get that. You, you say you're messing, but you're kind of not. Um, All the greatest uh, leaders of the Roman Empire were not the ones that inherited the throne in the bloodline. So the kids that grew up knowing they were going to be king all, t- all turned out to be assholes. Yeah. So... There is some, you know, respect to that. But then you can't really use that as an excuse for being ill-minded with investments. <laughs> to me, I think it's just something that doesn't excite me that much. And here's another thing that I could be completely wrong about. I've had like a lot of people, not a lot of people give me advice who don't have a very impressive portfolio of investments themselves. So I've had financial advisors going, can you ever sit down with me? And I'm like, yeah, sure. And then they're like 45, let's say. And I'm not being ageist. And they ran like a Daniel Wellington watch. And I'm like, this sounds like such an asshole. I go, if you're the expert in investments, shouldn't you be here like, oh, Ferrari keys on the table, 
expensive watch. Like with yourself, I listen to everything you're saying because you're more successful than me. You've written more books. You've got more of an investment portfolio. Your businesses do better. I'm all ears. I'm two ears and one mouth for a reason over here. But to a lot of people that give financial advice, they don't have a lot to back it up. And maybe it's all invested. Or maybe a lot of the information is just regurgitated. And I need to hear it. But I could be a different man even in this room today because you're probably the only person whose standpoint on investments I would respect enough to listen. Mm. And TikTok, I think, has made that a bit worse. Because, again, not being ages, but any kid can go and give you a 15-second video that does well on three ways to do this, that, or the other, and they haven't... Where do you stand on crypto? I think that Bitcoin is different from all other cryptos. So first thing you have to do is talk about, are you talking about Bitcoin or all other cryptos? Reason being, Bitcoin's really the only proven decentralized platform. All the others, even like Ethereum and Ripple and XRP, they're not fully decentralized and they'll go under when the business goes under. So, um, in the, so are we talking Bitcoin or crypto? So I, I, again, never got, so I'm this person, hate investments, people go, you should buy some Bitcoin. I'm like, fuck off. I'm like, I get it, I understand it. I think the blockchain is the future, especially for dodgy dealings, right? And I Vote, get ex- like, or voting. <laughs> yeah, like, and, and I was saying to my dad, like, I was like, dad, I reckon we're gonna soon buy and sell properties on the blockchain. And I was like, I was like stamp duty, tax, all of these things, I was going, you get mugged, even inheritance tax, which they don't have in Australia. I was like, whichever way you pass an asset, appreciated or not, you're gonna get fucked by someone. Yeah. I was like, wouldn't it be good to pass over the ownership of a house with a decentralized currency, no blueprint, but blockchain ownership? Do you reckon that's the way it's gonna go? Well, I think the, the speed it takes to buy a property is so out of date. I could pay you with a couple of little checks in an hour, a million pounds, but it would take me 90 days to buy a hundred grand house off you because of you know the conveyancing and all of that. And there's the money laundering and the whole, there's a lot of process paperwork in buying a property, which could all be done simultaneously and instantaneously on a blockchain, absolutely could. So I think the purchasing process is ready to be disrupted. And I haven't got the appetite or the interest to do that myself because I'm not very tax sa- tech savvy, but that for sure is, is coming. Um, In terms of ownership, I'm not sure. It has to be decentralized. Because, all right, the government could turn around when the world's fucked in the next three years, which it could be, and they could go, you don't own your property anymore. You know, we own it. It could just become the worst communist state ever. But it's very unlikely really fucking unlikely to happen. Property is going to be the last thing you're going to lose. Your land and property rights. They're more likely to say if your gold's illegal, you know, we want your gold. They've done it before in history. Um, so I think you need a decentralized ownership of property. So for, for a blockchain to work, it's got to be decentralized. And if the government make it, it ain't fucking decentralized. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. so the tech's there. It's like a central currency. A lot, I interviewed a, a billionaire who's He's like, you know, the central digital currency will be brilliant because the government will be able to instantly take your tax. And I'm thinking, that's not fucking good. That's fucking bad. Uh, You know, I want to have a bit of cash. I want to have a bit of independence. And so digital currency is very exciting. But the government-owned central digital currency, they can fuck off. That's more social credit system. than Yeah, yeah, and it could be that because they'll track your bank accounts and they'll track your spending habits and they go, oh, we want to fuel the economy. You've got 30 days to spend 10 grand or we're keeping it. And they can just fuck with you. Um, That's what I think is worrying as well. That's the kind of thing that I see. And, you know, I was very much pro-vaccine. You know, I wasn't anti-lockdown protesting. But when things went cashless, I was like, hold on a minute. I was like, there's other ulterior motives here. Then when people Is went, David Icke right after all? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're like, you know, traveling and all this stuff. And, oh, you can't travel here, can't do this. We saw very quickly that if the government wants to do something, they're going to do it. And, and know, they can do it fucking quick. Yeah. And, and um, no choice. Yeah. And, you know, so that's something that has always been like in my mind. But yeah, even with the, the crypto stuff, my friends are like, oh, I lost two grand in crypto. I'm like, you're a fucking carpenter. What are you doing buying crypto? Because your mate Jay was like, mate, it's going up. It's going up, mate. I was like, fuck you guys. I was like, they could be the only people that know less about investing than me. And um, yeah, it's one of those things. But like you say, 
I could very much change in the next few years. Having kids, probably going to change me. Mm. Getting married, probably going to change me. Sharing a life with someone that goes, I want to own this house. I go, okay, cool. But I think as far as investment and wealth, I have a very different idea of wealth where I'm stress-free, I work a handful of hours a day, I'm free to do what I want. Um, that kind of level of wealth, I think, should be just as aspirational as the financial freedom that comes with having a strong portfolio. Mm. And like, I joked with Stephen Bartlett, I go, you know, part of me thinks I'm wealthier than him, I just have less money. So it, it's again contextual with everything. Mm. Well, wealth from originates from the word wheel, which, which means well-being. Okay. So actually wealth is well-being. Wealth and money are very different. You know, money, currency, currency a form of money, but that's the origin of the word. So maybe you got something there. Maybe book four. <laughs> yeah. Which your publisher will title for you. Yeah, I'm sure they will, yeah. I do actually want to talk about that because it's a, a personal paradox of mine. Like, probably my most successful book, my two most successful books are Money and Life Leverage. And Money is a great fucking title and my publisher came up with it and I was coming up with all sorts of longer, more complicated, versions of that word and it was like they came up with it fucking great but but i wanted to write that book they just came up with the title my most recent book is probably my worst performing book so i obviously peaked too early and it's called opportunity seize the day win at life and the book's about opportunity it's not about winning at life and i thought it's just the most naff fucking subtitle sorry if they're they're listening but i ultimately agreed it so i take but seize the day win a life that was a struggle and a wrestle and therefore that book's not as good as it could have been so you wrote a book which you're promoting and everyone should definitely read and listen to but they titled it and the book you want to write isn't the book you've written so where do you sit because i've gained so much from my publishers so I'll probably hundreds of thousands, if not in the low millions, more than I'd have been able to sell on my own. But some of the stuff they gave me was gold and some of it was tin. So interesting enough, the idea for the book that I said I wanted to write has only come from the process of promoting this one. So it wasn't a precursor to yeah. this one. I wasn't sat there going, I don't want to write about confidence. I actually didn't think I'd write a third book. And then they were like, we think you'd be good at this. I'm like, cool, let's go. It was only doing the signings and the meet and greets and the promotion of this third book that I've seen a different demographic and I've gone, oh, I could talk to these people. So uh, to be honest, my publishers, they picked the title. I was like, cool. I like the cover, first one without me on it. I was like, I actually like that a lot more. And they give me free reign to write about whatever I want. And so the whole process of writing the book, the title I've been completely happy with. And like you say, self-publishing, you would have made a lot more money. But I would have sold a lot less books. Okay. But yeah. But like um, the PR standpoint on these things, I think for this cycle, they wouldn't even mind me saying this. We generated the majority of the PR and utilized many of my own assets like email marketing lists and social media platforms. Yeah, yeah we did that, but they got me in all the bookstores all around the world and the Waterstones and everything. I yeah. never would have done that. Those things are good. The yeah. only uh, annoying thing about that is like... Uh, uh, Amazon still definitely dominate as yeah. far as book sales and Waterstones, not to shit on them, they did a fantastic job for like book signings this week. The signed copies of my book that were supposed to go out nearly two weeks ago still haven't been shipped to people because they've got an issue with their headquarters. Now I'm getting complaints mm. of me being a shit person and I'm like, guys, I don't ship the books. So it's annoying that, you know, people have gone out their way to avoid the monster of Amazon to support their bookstores and the bookstores haven't yeah. delivered their promises. And if that's just for my book or a lot of others, that market is just, which is probably 80%, 90% Amazon, might have just gone to 95. And that's a worrying thing, because like you say, there's such power to having mm. bookstores, and I'm very grateful to them, going to signings, we like go along to all of them, and I think it's a great place to, I even banter people. If I go at an airport, WH Smith, someone's like in the non-fiction, I'm like, that's a good book, that. And they, they, they it never ends out well. People are like, fuck off. <laughs> like, no, no one's like, oh my God, is that your book? Let me buy it. That's yeah, never happened. No. People are like, what? And then my mate would be like, oh, it's his book. And they'd be like, don't talk to me. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm grateful with publishers as well just mm. to uh, do a lot of that. But I don't think I would sign off or do anything I didn't want to do. Yeah. So basically they picked the title and you liked it. So you went with it. You didn't have the paradox of are they turning? And... I'm published with this shit. I fucking love them as well. Um, I just talk openly about the 
because that creative struggle I think is important because I learned a lot from my publishers they know stuff about the book market that I don't because they're a publisher but you know you're talking about you'd rather write one book that you love and sell one copy than make sell 10 million of a book you didn't really want to write well out of all the books I've written there was one I really didn't want to write but I suppose I've got to take responsibility for that yeah and I, I think that I get on really well with uh, my team at HarperCollins UK. I'm like, they. I'm, I feel like we're at the point now where if I said something, they go fuck off, James. And I go, oh, I like these people. Yeah. You know, I I spoke about um, like people like Conor McGregor, who I admire in some respects. I think he's a bit of a prat in others, um, which is probably what a lot of people might say about me. But I feel like he has too many yes men around him. I don't think anyone's around him going, Conor, don't be a fucking idiot, mate. And I love those people. Yeah. I think they're integral to being successful. Mm. And um, yeah, it's like. I know that if I was, and my manager as well, if I said something, he, he's got such a vested interest in the trajectory of my career that he would never get me to write bullshit just to sell a million copies. Yeah. Because then I'd just be Joe Wicks with short hair. <laughs> <laughs> so the book's called How To Be Confident. We'll shout it out at least 17 more times before we're finished. Um, should we do a different type of round now? Should we change it up a bit? Sure. All right, so I've got a would you rather round. Okay, let's go. Cool. So I'm just talking Thank the you. <laughs> Would you rather have one million pound cash or one million followers and why? Uh, definitely the cash because um, I could use that to have a good time with my mates. You can't pay for dinner or, you know, go on a boat in Croatia with fucking million followers. You know, <laughs> you might get a free meal in Dubai, but, you know, you can't really enjoy your life. And some of the most... Uh, like enjoyable things in my life have been buying people stuff. Like um, my mum and dad bought my first car and probably my second car. Not expensive ones, I like a Fiat Punto. But now that's my thing where I'm like, cool, I'll buy you a nice car. And like, I surprised my dad with the last one. And I'd much rather have that look on his face than I would a million followers. Would you rather be fat and rich or ripped and broke? Ooh. <sighs> Quite a tough one, really. Again, I'd like a middle ground, but it's a dichotomy here. <sighs> Probably, probably fat and rich. I go through cycles probably once a year of being, when I finish the touring events, it's like, oh, I'm fat and I feel like shit, but you earn good money out of tickets. So <laughs> yeah. ask me again in a month, I'll tell you what it's like. Yeah. Would you rather only be a personal trainer, fitness coach, or only be the entrepreneur or the businessman side? Um, Can only have one. I like being the coach, I like being the PT. I like that some people go, oh, you know, stop being called that when you interview because you've probably done more as an author than a PT. But I like that. It's my roots and I'm grateful to it. And ultimately, I got into a profession helping people with their problems. And that's never changed. I just don't go into a gym anymore to work. I still identify people's pain points and offer the solution to the best of my abilities. So in some respects, I'm still a personal trainer. I'm just offering more than just weights and calories. Mm. Would you rather work out with Arnold Schwarzenegger or Dwayne Johnson and why? Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, you know, like there's that clip of him with the cigar. He's like, I get to smoke stogies in my house because I'm the man. And I'm like, <laughs> and like uh, my two favorite feelings in life are getting the pump, having sex with a woman. Now look at him, I get to do both of it. Hey. So like, he's the OG. <laughs> the Rock is a bit too, uh, he's, he's a bit woke. You, you have to be to have that level of fame. And I remember Logan Paul saying that it was the only hero he met that he kind of, was a bit like, nah, because him and The Rock did some content together, but when Logan Paul got canceled for a video that he did that went bad, The Rock messaged him and said, get all the videos down with us. And I was a bit like, oh, that kind of stung a bit. Arnie, I reckon he'd be like, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you've done. You're still my guy. <laughs> what do you mean by Dwayne Johnson's a bit, bit woke? Like the fact that he would do that, everything's very like politically correct and, on, it, on his socials, not to say that Arnie's not. I just reckon, you know, if someone said, you got to eat a load of magic mushrooms and go into Coachella, who are you going with, The Rock or Arnie? I'd be like, let's go with Arnie. I reckon he'd like to party a bit more. <laughs> I reckon he'd have more stories. Do you know he's got a lot of property, you might fall out with him. <laughs> oh yeah, maybe. <laughs> we need people to buy it. Yeah. Would you rather fight Eddie Hall or Jake Paul if you were doing this celebrity YouTube fights? Probably Eddie Hall. We've, had a, we've not had beef, but he did a useless supplement for it. Jake Paul can, can box. And um, 
I quite, I'd probably, probably Eddie Hall, I'd get beaten, I'd lose, but then I could just say, hey, it's the world's strongest man. What do you expect? <laughs> and Jake Paul would probably bang you out in style, so uh, yeah, Eddie Hall. And what do you think about these sort of YouTubers who've gone into boxing and are really throwing boxing and martial arts into, well, they're disrupting it, what would you say about I like that? it, because if you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. You know, like ultimately people go, it's ruining boxing. I'm like, if you love boxing that much, stop buying the fucking pay-per-views, you know? So um, they're also making it interesting. I mean, again, people are tuning in to watch him lose. That's a beautiful thing that people will underestimate. Same with the number one grappler in jiu-jitsu, a guy called Gordon Ryan. People fucking hate him, but they pay a lot of money because they want to watch him lose. So, you know, you're bumping up the sport, you're bumping people in it, you're lifting people up the ranks. It's also nice to have a power player that's not the OG, you've got Jake Paul chatting shit to Dana White about pay conditions for fighters. Now, that's embarrassing. And when he, uh, it's the, I think it's nice to have someone to air the laundry of a big corporation like that, to be like, hey, you pay these fighters shit and you don't even give them medical or whatever. And um, in that respect, he's almost like a, I, there's a lot of things I don't like about Jake Paul, especially his dress style, his dress sense or his rap videos. I like what he's doing. Mm. And I mean, um, he's fighting Anderson Silva, right? Yeah, it looks Big like it, although for... he's fucking said about five people he's fighting recently and it's not come off enough. He's, got, he gonna... he's got a date with Anderson Silva. Has he though? And they've done the press right. conference. There's also a good picture. Of, he met him when Anderson Silva visited Ohio like 15 years ago or whatever and they got picked together and they recreated the pick. Right. Anderson Silva's there to bang him out. He's there to knock Anderson Silva out. But this is also a very good pay slip for a, a fighter that's past his prime. And although the critics can say he's fighting someone who's past his prime, it's a couple million dollars into Anderson Silva's bank account. I think that's great. Same with Ben Askren, biggest pay he ever got for a fucking fight. Fair enough. He probably earned 100 grand a minute or something close to yeah. <laughs> and got knocked the fuck out. Even Tyrone Woodley, I mean, even before he bought him a Rolex to jump in the fight at the last minute, he's better in the lives of the people he's fighting which is very rare to see in a combative situation. Yeah. So I, can't, I actually admire it and I think yeah. that He's very interesting. He made about $40 million last year just from the boxing. Yeah. He's probably got a few properties. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm just not wealthy enough yet to be able to uh, have the luxury of property investment. I'm not there yet. Or maybe that's a barrier I'm putting up to excuse my inaction. Well, one thing to consider, I'm not giving you any advice because that's not my job. Read the books. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know how much inflation is eating savings. That's fucking motivation. So when you have X millions in the banks and you might be having that or getting there and you work out, okay, what's minus 15% of 5 million? So investing is not just to build wealth, have passive income, retire, have a pension. It's to protect what you've got. And that's a different mindset because actually you can lock money into an investment that just means you don't lose 15% in fuck inflation. Yeah, there is, there is that. I completely empathise with that as well. I mean, and then you've got the option of pulling it out and paying tax on it, which no, I don't want to do that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think the main driver for me at the moment is to have something to show for it. And, like, you know, I'd love to be able to buy that dream home in Australia when I get residency. Residency, again, is obviously a big thing. Otherwise, you've got to pay 25% tax on top as a non-resident buyer fee. Yeah. So... There's doing that, and then it'd be nice to have like an apartment or a house in Bondi and just be like, hey guys, thanks for your support, I bought this today. Um, that would be absolutely fine, but what I don't want is five houses in Basingstoke, mm. They're all in a line, semi-detached or whatever, like, okay, hey guys, I buy these houses for tenants, <laughs> come on, <laughs> <laughs> let's go. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I think for the right, for the right investment, it'll be right. Yeah. But for the time being, I'll just eat the 15%. And that 15% is motivating me. I'm going to write one hell of a marketing email on the way back. <laughs> yeah. Tell you that, let's recoup that 15%. Let's go. Yeah. Um, let's do, if you're up for it, a have you ever round. Yeah? Yeah, go on. All right. So have you ever done a call out video, you're good at them, that you regret? Yeah, yeah. You know, I feel bad sometimes. Got like, any um, specific ones? That probably you the Joe Wicks ones, if I'm honest. Yeah. Like, you know, it was a very easy way just to chuck petrol on the fire. Uh, I'm sure he's a nice guy. You're not sure. met him? Not no, I'm not no. met him. I sent him a, an email back in the day saying, you know, you never get put down by people above you in life. And I stand by that now. Um, and I look back at some of them now, myself a little bit younger, probably had a bit too much coffee and I'm like, 
maybe I didn't need to do it quite so hard, but that's probably just the maturation process. But that's because I, I, from people that over the years that I met him, they're like, he's a good guy. And I'm like, fuck, maybe I did call that a good guy. Whereas some people are just pricks that kind of do deserve it. But um, yeah, maybe that. I'll, mm. keep, I'll keep them up there mm. for the engagement. <laughs> How are you going to feel when people start calling out you big time? They do. And do you know what? Yeah. I'm like fair play because this discourse, whether it's public or private, is an essential part. And, you know, it's like gang warfare. It's like rappers going, you know, beef in rappers benefits both sides. And when people come for me, I'm like, you go for that, bro. I'm like, use a better camera, get a professional light. I'm like, get, bro, get a good lapel. Yeah, get a get a roadcaster. Yeah, I noticed you were giving our tech the yeah. once over, weren't you? Yeah, you know, get yeah. get a variable lens, you know, mate. Let's come on, pick up that camera game a bit. So then, yeah, but all to them, you know, I can't sit here and be like, oh no, it's only okay for me to call people out. You can't do it. Yeah. So I'm never gonna be on the high horse of that. But mm. it's uh, yeah, let them let them do it. Yeah. Fair play. Go get that money. <laughs> Have you ever trolled? or hated on someone on social media? Not really, no. no. Just my mates, just mm. my best mates really. No, I've never genuinely had hatred towards anyone. No. I think if you, if you see someone and you, you feel a bit of a resistance to it, sometimes you need to choose to be inspired by that person, not to hate them. Mm. Because often that feeling you have is jealousy or envy. Mm. And it's very easy to mask that as hate. That's probably one of the things I had towards Joe Wicks, probably jealousy and envy. Yeah. So I'll openly admit that. Mm. that's fine and now I kind of yeah you know recognize that a bit more but at 26 I didn't so yeah just now nah, never genuine hate I've never been like oh I want to fucking deck this guy no nah. and the day I do meet him I'll be like mate fair play still making more money than me <laughs> keep doing your thing yeah. so obviously I didn't damage it too much no have you ever photoshopped or filtered a photo of yourself online only to show you before and after of what it looks like mm. never anything else. No. I might bring the saturation down if I've spent too long in the sun. <laughs> and then, then that's it, so I don't get the sun cream police on me. Yeah. But nah, never. And uh, you know, I, I'm quite happy. I, it's a strength for me to show myself not in shape or you mm. know, um, in a pair of budgie smugglers or whatever. And yeah, authenticity will always be a virtue that I value. Mm. I know you've been open about um, fat burners you've taken. Have you ever taken steroids? Yeah, anabolic yeah. steroids. Uh, two, Have you three done cycles. content on that before? Yeah, and I oh. openly say to people, like, this is me on steroids. Funny, I look like all the guys that say they're not on steroids. I'm like, what a coincidence. And then I talk about, you know, injecting my ass cheek and the strength gains. And I tell people how amazing it is. Because, and people go, it sounds like, you know, you, James, you're supposed to be deterring you. I'm like, no, it's great. You know, again, Jordan Peterson, let's not ask people why they do cocaine. Because we know why, because it fucking feels amazing. Let's ask them why they don't do it every day. And then that's a more important question. The same with steroids. Let's not go, steroids are terrible because they're not. You feel fucking amazing. You're like a dog with two dicks who gets more muscular by the week. Your friends will say to you, wow, you have more muscle than a week ago. But the negatives of that are, once you do something with that, it's very difficult to move away. And I compare it to MDMA at a festival. You go to a festival, you take MDMA, it's great. If you start developing a drug problem, you might just have to say, right, let's not go to any festivals this year. Cool, you've now kind of killed that gateway to you taking the MDMA in the majority of cases. But when gym is life, gym is everything, you go to the gym every day, you go there before work so you don't sit in traffic, suddenly doing that without steroids becomes a very difficult issue for people. So I'm open about it, I tell people how great they are and then on the flip side, I tell them that it's something you probably don't wanna get coupled up in bed with because no one's gonna care when you're 50. No one's going to care. Even people like Dorian Yates, people respect him much more as an intellectual than as a bodybuilder now. So, yeah, people should proceed with caution. I mean, if you're going to make a living from it, like Arnie, fair enough. But if you're just doing it recreationally to manage your insecurities, you're going to be insecure either way. Just one with a lot more mass that your heart's got to pump blood around and one without. Do you think the conversation of steroids is had enough? No. Because people, if you're a bodybuilder and you're in the fitness industry and you've got, you know, fucking, you're, you've got a Gymshark, 10 grand a month, you've got my protein, five grand a month, your mortgage on all your houses is being paid for by the lie that you're portraying that you're natural. So you can't just unveil it and be like, hey, I'm not natural. So, you know, people are financially gonna be worse off. And you say to most people, would you lie about being on steroids for 20 grand a month? I don't blame them for saying no. What do you think of being eye candy for middle-aged women? Yeah, it's all right. 
<laughs> you, Harry had another word for them, but I don't think I can say it. <laughs> Milfs? Yeah, yeah. Um, I had my fun with that. Yeah. Um, you know, I was fucking a lot of my clients before I had a big following. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so nothing's changed, just people know about it now. Yeah, and then uh, to be fair, I got that out of the system. I'm now in a happy relationship, and I know it's not congruent to a good life. Um, and again, that's probably something I tell younger people. I'm like, you think you're a lad when you fucked 100 women, then afterwards you're like, oh, is that it? Same as getting a million followers, you're like, oh, is that it? Um, when really, you know, it, it was fun, got it out of the way. But yeah, it was, it was great. But now, unfortunately, I'm eye candy to young lads that probably want my AP, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think times change. Mm. What do you think of the liver king? I hated him at first. Why? Um, dishonest about steroid use. 100%. Is he still not? Still, yeah. He even did still a video out said where he had like needles pointing into cakes. He was like, oh, I'm not on, like, or whatever. And the actual needles were the exact ones you would use to inject steroids. So I'm like, funny that you sent your PA out to get needles and you got the exact ones you would use for intramuscular injections, which are less common than, say, subcutaneous that you would use for insulin. And then uh, listening to his, like, in longer format, when he went on Logan Paul Impulsive, I was like, actually, his why is quite profound. His execution is effective. He's doing about 100 million a year in supplements, supplement sales. So I had to look past the envy. I had to look past the jealousy of someone flying private jet everywhere with that stuff on. And, you know, really actually understand why I felt that way. And the truth is that he's found a niche. He's dominating it. Probably not in the most ethical way. But I, at the same time as disapproving his methodologies, I have admiration for his execution of it. What do you now think about Joe Wicks? Do you know what? I feel that, you know, we spoke about hit and training and like being mass marketable. I don't think that's him. I think you've got a hardworking person who's a great face of a business. And then think you've got a good marketing team around him that have probably utilized that to its highest potential. I think that I saw that from a place of envy and jealousy. I attacked him ad hominemly, if that's the right word. What is that word? where you attack someone, not what they say or do, but the character of that person. Ah, yeah. So like, I almost, I didn't like the machine behind him and I attacked him for it. Right. When it probably wasn't even his choice. Probably, you know, whatever it was, it was very easy for me to, there was a lot of things I was angry about the fitness industry about. I still am. But he was a figurehead that I was like, right, you represent what I don't like, therefore I'm gonna use you to, to step up. And now I don't know whether or not that was good or bad. Probably, you know, as I get a bit older, I probably think that's good shit move. I have no problem with the person. Has he helped tens of thousands of people? Yes. Has he potentially not helped tens of thousands of people? Potentially, yes. Yeah. I like to think that I've made a business out of helping all the people that he failed. And I can sleep at night knowing that, he can sleep at night knowing that. And any beef that we've ever had is, you know, just strengthened both our parties. Yeah. And they're, they're never gonna go to war. They're never gonna see someone pick up a Joe Wicks cookbook and Waitrose and whack them from behind or anything like that. So, <laughs> You know, I've, I've only ever attacked his principles, not him as a person. Yeah. We, you've referenced a few times on this chat, Jordan Peterson. What do you think of Jordan Peterson? Yeah, I really like him. Yeah. And I think that, you know, even if you disagree with him or you think he's sexist and misogynist, he wants the world to work. And I think that, you know, even his standpoint of saying to people, he wants, he helped me understand myself. And that's quite a profound thing. For someone else to know how my mind works when I don't even understand. And um, helping men understand who they are helps women. And I think people don't appreciate that enough. It seems like, you know, oh, his audience are all men, oh, they're all misogynists. We label these people. If you help a man come to terms with who he is, every man has a woman around him. Even, you know, even if you're in a gay relationship, you've got mothers, you've got sisters, you've got nieces, whatever it is. Helping men only benefits the lives of not only men, but women. And yeah, I think it, every time I try and see him get canceled for whatever, people just aren't listening to enough of him. Even with the Andrew Tate scenario. Now I don't agree with everything he said. Do I think he should have been no platformed? Probably not quite so severely, but me and my friends were like, joke, I'll be like, I'll joke and say top G. I'll say, should we get some cigars tonight? Just joking. And girls, even girls I know, they go, I fucking hate that guy, he's a fucking, and I go, okay, cool, cool, relax. What is it you don't like about him? What is it he said that's annoyed you? And they can't reference one thing. And I'm like, okay, you, you saw a snapshot of someone taking out context, now you hate someone for it? I mean, 
how is that a logical decision? I go, name one argument that you don't like. And they're like, oh, I'm a sex trafficker. And I'm like, do you know the story? No, I don't. Cool. And that's quite annoying because I think the same thing's happened with Pete's. And they've seen one snapshot where he doesn't support pronouns and being legal mandate in Canada and everyone's going, oh my God, he fucking hates trans people. I'm like, no, <laughs> I very much doubt he does. He just doesn't like the way that words are being used as weapons. Mm. So yeah, I'm a big fan. And even if that lost me followers, I'll fall on the sword. <laughs> <laughs> and you mentioned Andrew Tate. What do you think about the whole Andrew Tate's rise and cancel? For who I assume is an intelligent person, I think he should have, he should have done better. So chess champion, you know, uh, dad from a military background, obviously intelligent and driven and whatever. Straight white male, obviously. <laughs> and um, I get that he was identifying and becoming a persona to manipulate the system of socials or whatever. And I, I get that because I do it myself. There was a time to stop. There was a time to cash out. There was a time to embrace humility. There was a time to pull the veil on whatever character he was playing and he didn't do it in time and he faced the repercussions. Do you only know when that time is when you've gone too far though? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think for myself, like, there's obviously this like, we call it 2018 James. I was ready to burn down anyone. Then as I get to 2022 James, I've kind of done longer format stuff, admitted even with you today that I was an arsehole, I regret some of the things I've done and that I was just trying to get a leg up. The whole Joe Wicks thing, for instance, I'm happy to say that. If I was to continue 2018 James on a trajectory, it would just hit a point, I'd just burn into the ground. So there has to be a maturation process in your brand and persona. So when you say burn into the ground, do you mean you would hate yourself or you would end up getting cancelled and something bad happened? Not even cancelled or something bad happening. I think people just go, yeah, we've had enough, mate. Oh, guess what? You find someone, oh, you think someone's a prick? Cool, tell us what else, you know? It would just get to the point where people just be sick of the negativity. Yeah. They thought, let's calm it down a bit, let's give some life advice, let's try and give valuable content and maybe stop trying to attack people so much and just trying to benefit the situation. Yeah. He could, have, he could have done that, he probably should have. And mm. I could even tell you the exact podcasts where when he went on Nelk Boys in Croatia, a big American podcast, I was like, I watched it thinking this is your time. Be, be your father's son. And he didn't. And he leaned on Islam a few times and I was like, you're, you're being a prick. And it was annoying because I followed him for like four years. A friend of mine, we were talking about the follow one follow culture. I see people unfollow me and refollow me. I'm like, what was with these people? And my friend said to me four years ago, he goes, there's only one person that I followed and unfollowed. And he goes, look at this prick. And I followed him four years ago. So I've watched him for quite a while. Mm. And I was disappointed when I watched Nelt Boys. I was like, mate, don't, you're portraying a misogynistic turn point and you're trying to use Islam as your backup. So the people, when they criticize you, they'll, they'll be seen as like Islam criticizers. And I was like, it was disappointing. I was genuinely disappointed. But the thing was. So you think he's that engineered and calculated about it all? Yeah, I would like to think so. Yeah. And again, I've never met him. I've only, I'm as guilty as everyone else on the yeah. left. And why would you like to think that it was engineered? Um, because I could understand why he would do it. And it obviously worked. From a marketer standpoint, I was fascinated. And what annoyed me was uh, I was losing hundreds of followers a day because I was following him during the cancellation period. People were like, I'm in your program. I'm going to leave if you don't unfollow him. And I'm like, guys, I'm curious. I'm a digital marketer. Mm. I'm, I've been watching this guy for four years. I'm as disappointed as you are. But I'm not going to unsubscribe to watching the demise of someone because I can learn from his demise. And it was annoying that every, it became mob mentality. Yeah. People are like, anyone that follows him is bad. I'm like, Joe Rogan follows him. I think Joe Rogan's a great guy. Yeah. We're all just watching this guy portray this character. And yeah, it was one of those things where um, it was a bit, bit disappointing, but oh well, like, I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. He actually, we spoke about creating a, a book maybe for young males. There's definitely a figurehead position that needs to be filled. Yeah. So I'm not saying that I'm going to be the next Andrew Tate, but I'm saying that should have been a wake up for a lot of people that, you know, Jordan Peterson as well, there, there do need to be role models to help men on their path of life because I didn't particularly have a, a male figurehead to look up to. Maybe some mentors in the PT world, but, you know, it, our parents are so valuable to us and they should instill values into us, but they can't show us how the world works or how we fit into it because the world is so different to what it was then to what it is now. We have a quick fire round we always finish with. Up for it? Yeah. All right. Um, generally, people don't end up answering the questions quickly. You can do what you want, depending on how itchy you are to leave. <laughs> do we have true freedom of speech right now? No. 
we don't. Certain things, you know, you can't use the C word on uh, YouTube anymore. Uh, demonetized for that. Uh, and they put it with two... Beat me. Yeah, <laughs> two very offensive words. Two words you would never say ever, ever in speech. Now the C word's gone up with that. And I joke in my live show, I talk about the origin of the word. In the 13th century, the C word was the anatomical terms in linguistic journals of how you would explain female genitalia. It was even in street names. So there's that from the swear word standpoint, but there's also um, even podcasts are being deleted for talking about Andrew Tate's ban. Not in the detail we have, but... As in, they go into more detail, you mean? Yeah, yeah. That maybe it was a clip from it. So, you know, freedom of speech isn't freedom of speech. It's nearly freedom of speech. It's enough to paint the guys, but yeah. Uh, a lot of things you're not allowed to say, especially if it's anti-narrative. I didn't believe this until I used uh, DuckDuckGo, the search engine It's different to Google. So if you try and find some things on topics like Tate, you type it in, Google, nothing. DuckDuckGo, you find all the topics that are hidden from search engines. So that's quite a cool one. That's a bit of Tim Foro hat on. <laughs> Is there an argument to say, well, their platform, their rules? Yeah, absolutely. But then who's governing the rules? Is it the platform? Is it the government? Who, is it? I think, Who should it be? Uh, I don't know. Uh, ivermectin was an interesting one. Again, I was pro-vaccine. I was saying to people, stop being a fuckwit, get vaccinated. I want to go back to Australia. So then Joe Rogan took ivermectin and he was like, oh my God, horse dewormer, whatever. But over a billion humans have had ivermectin. So you're like, is it a horse dewormer? And then there's all of that. I'm pretty sure they've just slyly put ivermectin into the uh, uh, medical list of tr effective remedies for COVID-19. They just slipped it in there like last week. And everyone's like, hold on a second. Wasn't that what you were deplatforming people for a year ago? So, you know, they, it was very smart. Uh, Brett Weinstein, I think, that was one of the first ones that go, hey, by the way, ivermectin is something else that people could use alongside. When you go to Texas, I was in Texas in December, everyone's got a stash of ivermectin. They're not uh, vaccinated. They go, if I get it, I'm just going to take this. But yeah, you couldn't say that. So no, I don't think freedom of speech exists. Not as bad as other countries like socialist states. It's not North Korea. It's not Russia. Mm. But it's not quite there. Mm. Who controls the world? I don't know. It's not Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> the deep state. I don't know, you'd like to think the people. I honestly don't know. I don't think about that question enough. My mental computing hasn't wandered off into that enough. Um, I don't know. You're going to keep me awake with that tonight. Well, something that's just really interesting what you said um, is I don't think about that enough. If there's things to lie awake about, who controls our world is probably one of them, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I joke about this as well. When people say, what's your celebrity crush? And I say, I don't think about that because it's mental computing to a scenario I'll never use. You know, there's no point in me thinking about, you know, a fit celebrity and banging her because I'll never bang her. So it's a waste of mental computing. Now, I don't think we'll ever know who runs the world. I'd rather be thinking about aliens or like Roswell or all of those things because I don't think we'd ever get an answer of uh, who runs the world. So it's one of those things I should put to bed. Think about other things mm. like property prices. <laughs> and investment. The inflation. Yeah. Um, this will probably be like episode number 853 or whatever. It's, you know, we've done a lot of shows. And um, up until last week, and this hasn't even gone live yet, we'd never talked about aliens. And you just mentioned it. So we had, I won't ruin it for everyone in case this comes out before that episode, but we had our first conversation in that many episodes about aliens. Fuck it, let's do it. Is there life outside of humans? There has to be. Because if you, you can think about divine creation or whatever, but statistically for all the atoms and all of the periodic table in the universe to collide together, different bundles of gravity, life was formed. And even if the statistical chances was one in a hundred billion million, whatever, that's still plenty. Loads of life around the universe for things floating around the sun to be able to create life. I think absolutely. I think that the, the biggest thing would be how long it would take. So even if something was 15,000 light years away, which isn't far by any means, if they were to look at our planet through a telescope, they'd see woolly mammoths and saber-toothed tigers. So someone would have to be very close to us to even be bothered about our existence. So when people say, why haven't aliens visited us? Well, if they're in a different galaxy, they're looking at the world hundreds of thousands of years ago, if not, not millions of years ago. 
So there's nothing really interesting for them to come. I do then hypothesize that maybe they have been or have been visiting. Commander David Fravor, the Tic Tac, San Diego, military aircraft, all of these things. So there's some more documented stuff of this and I find it fascinating, but I think Brian Cox says it best. He goes, whether there is alien life or there isn't, both are very, very scary, daunting things to realize. Mm. Mm. How do you sell anything to anyone? Give me this pen, <laughs> sell me this pen. <laughs> uh, identify pain points and then present the solution to the pain point. You know, whether it's a chiropractor, oh, you got that back, come in here, let's give you an x-ray. Oh, that vertebrae, L3 is not looking good. How old are you, 30? That's an L3 of a 50 year old. What can you do? Adjustments twice a week, 35 pounds each. What will happen? We'll make the pain go away. So yeah, present solutions to pain points and people either buy it or they won't. What's the craziest thing that's ever happened in your life? It's gonna sound pretty bad. Uh, I once was in Manchester uh, visiting some friends for New Year's Eve and it's nearly 10 years ago, I swiped it on Tinder and matched a few girls, went out for New Year's Eve and I got chatting to a girl. She said, I'm in a bar. So me and my friends went to the bar, ended up hooking up with that chick. She didn't just live in the same area as my friend. She didn't just live in the same grouping of apartment blocks. She didn't just live in the same apartment. She lived in the door opposite the door I was staying in. The door opposite. Manchester is a pretty densely populated part of the UK. Statistically, what are the chances that I went home with a girl that lived two and a half meters away from where I was staying? To this day, I think there's a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> so that'd be the craziest thing. <laughs> What's the biggest risk you've ever taken? Going to Australia, one way, no savings. Just I had a psychedelic trip that introspectively told me that I should go to Australia. And I told my dad, he goes, yeah, go for it. I had no money, I had to borrow money off my dad to buy a sofa. <laughs> my housemates bought the sofa and they're like, you owe 300 quid. So uh, I had to borrow money off my dad at 26. So I, it was a bit of, financially a bit of a stupid one to go to Australia, but I went, best decision I ever made. Everyone thought I was crazy because my PT business was pretty good in the UK. I was spending all the money I was earning. So I'm a great time. Played rugby sevens abroad every weekend. Way this weekend, not Amsterdam. Way this weekend, Stockholm. Way this weekend, Dubai. But um, yeah, going to Australia on paper was the most ridiculous move ever. And yeah, it was probably the best decision of my life. What's your biggest success? Loving my life. I imagine this, right? There are a lot of people on the planet. I would not swap my lives, my life with anyone's. 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 Even Dan, Dan Bozerian, whoever it is, no one. There's not one person on earth I'd want to swap my life with. And I think that is the biggest ultimate success you could ever have. Because so many people do live their lives wishing they could be other people. And hand on heart, that's the most honest thing I've probably said to you the whole conversation. I would not swap my life with anyone. And I think that is probably one of the highest kind of accolades of success you could ever reach. What's your biggest failure? It's not even a good one. Just, I was obviously this PT that went to Australia. When I first got there, I tried to become a PT back like I was in the UK on the floor. And I, couldn't, I just couldn't build a business. And it was part of me that didn't want to, but it was again then the biggest blessing ever because I went online. So I was throwing everything I had at the gym floor and it wasn't working. And then I threw everything I had to Facebook and it did work. So the, I'm most grateful for my biggest failure. What's your biggest regret? Again, this is another part of my brain. I don't like to entertain the computing power of it because I'm, I don't really regret anything. May I actually, I dropped a whole pill going into a Schweier for Eric Prids in Ibiza three years ago. And you would have found me laying on my back in the garden of Ashwara and Eric Prids is my favorite DJ. And uh, I was laying on the floor, my manager pouring water in my mouth going, you're all right? I was like, yeah. And uh, yeah, I came up so hard, I had to leave my favorite DJ. That's my biggest mistake. I could have died, no, I didn't die. But do you know what? I've never thought of it like that either. I've ruined a perfectly good night in Ibiza. Don't be a hero, do halves. <laughs> In 850 whatever episodes, something else I've never talked about is um, psychedelics, ayahuasca, whatever. I've never taken any psychedelics ever. Um, I have opened the door in my mind to having an ayahuasca experience before, not done it yet. Have you had ayahuasca and what's your experience of psychedelics, good, bad? 
never done ayahuasca. It seems like a bit too like go to Peru and shit your pants. I'm like, I'm, just like, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's not the best selling point I, of this does. <laughs> I, I don't need that much help. Yeah. Um, first time I took uh, psychedelics was LSD. I was like, wow, this is, this is just brilliant. And I thought to my, every time I've taken psychedelics, I thought, why do I drink? I like, it just made me realize how disgusting alcohol is, what it does. Um, I only take psychedelics when I want answers. And sometimes the crazy thing is, I sometimes want answers to questions I haven't thought of yet. Sometimes I just go through life, I go, I can need some answers. Right now I've got no inclination to do some. One of my best mates has got magic mushrooms at his house and I'm like, mate, I don't, I don't need this right now. Not that I don't want to, I just don't need the wisdom that's in there. And uh, some of the biggest epiphanies I've had in life have come from little psychedelic trips. And if I say to people, I've done magic mushrooms straight away, they're like, that's bad. Me and 10 friends, went to this like cliff edge in Sydney on a sunny day and we sat there. We put music in, I listened to Hans Zimmer, I looked at the clouds, I looked at dolphins in the sea and whales and boats and I was like having an amazing moment. Then we all over that fruit platter just spoke about life, spoke about our experiences, spoke about how we felt. And that, I was like, I knew more about my friends in one afternoon than I had in years of knowing them. Not to mention- You were all on mushrooms at this point. All on mushrooms, yeah. None of us touched our phones. The idea of a phone was like, that's disgusting. Mm. and we just enjoyed each other's company in a way that was like never been done before. And another really non-committal one is DMT. You now DMT lasts about the length of one song. So uh, I spoke about it on a podcast, someone DM'd me, a guy delivered it to me on roller skates in Bondi, guy from, and I got it in a vape. He said, just go outside and have a few puffs. Went outside my balcony, put on London Grammar, did about four tokes of this vape, put it down, and had a, I felt like I visited the universe in five minutes, came back around, and I had a whole set of things to think about that even to this day, I'm still breaking down. And they've all been net positive experiences. Even um, the one time I did take too many mushrooms, I went under some bed sheets with a packet of Starburst and just ate them, <laughs> I was tripping balls. And I came out and I made it out before the New Year's Eve countdown. And everyone's like, ah, oh, he's alive, I'm like, yes. So uh, yeah. To me, they're all net positive experiences. I don't recommend them for everyone because some people just don't want to put themselves in that position. My mom and dad weren't too happy when I told them. But to me, they were, my, after psychedelic trips, I've given up drinking for stints. I've looked hard enough to get into a long-term relationship. All the thoughts and feelings I've had about my life, it's always pointed me in the direction of you know, what's important. And to that, I'll always be grateful to them. That I've gone from, strong atheist to agnostic for psychedelics. So like, I've always been like, there's nothing, this doesn't make sense, all this like literature. Doing psychedelics, I'm like, there's something. I don't know what it is, I don't think it's a god, but there's something. And, and I guarantee any person who's done psychedelics will sit in front of me and tell you that. It, it, the dimensions that we experience life in, there's more to them. And for me, it's a magical thing to experience them. I'm quite passionate about it. Mm, I'm glad I asked. You're, you're a good salesman. <laughs> this show is called Disruptors. What does the word disruptive mean to you? Go against the grain to, you know, not conform to societal norms, which is what most people are bred to do, to just conform. Not in like a law sense, but the opportunity is rife. It's made, you've probably done this yourself, where you spend 15 minutes with someone and disrupt their life forever. I had a driver the other day that picked me up from the airport and he was a good looking, tall lad. And I like, I was like, what are you doing driving? I was like, I'm gonna fucking hire you if not. I was like, I need someone like you in a bit. And I got chatting to him and uh, it turns out he actually owned the business. They leased cars, private jets, the lot. So I was like, okay, you're a big dog. You, you're not just driving, but I was, I was getting into it in 15 minutes. I think that whatever path his life was going on, I think I disrupted it and I changed his trajectory. Only in line with where he wants to go. People don't often do things they don't wanna do but I love the idea of being able to slightly alter the path or direction someone's going in their life. That's true disruption. And hopefully your book can be that for everyone watching and listening. So how to be confident, where can they get it? And just give us a bit of a flavor of what's in it. Any bookstore, Audible, I narrate it. In essence, people probably buying the book think they need confidence, I disagree. I think they need a different lens to see the world, their problems, their perceptions. I've been using many tools for many years to accomplish success. That's half the book. And the other half are things I learned in pursuit of trying to figure out more about confidence. I read the top five books on confidence beforehand and I thought they were all shit. So 
hopefully, no offense to anyone that wrote those books, but hopefully that will give them the kick in the ass to read it. And then where should we follow you? Where are you most active? Where should people? Everywhere. <laughs> James, James Smith, put James Smith PT into any platform and they'll find me. James, it's been fun. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers. Wow, so I told you we covered a lot in this interview. Let me know in the comments, what did you like, dislike, what did you agree with, and what didn't you agree with? If you'd like to watch more Disruptors interviews, you can watch them here. But quickly before you go, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn the notification bell on. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.